Okay, I think we are ready to go and I will call the meeting to order. Uh, start by asking Councillor Brown to uh, identify herself. Yes, Carrie Brown, District 3. Thank you. And I'll note that uh, Councillor Alfano is, is not here because of uh, family events and he may uh, log in later, but for now we'll proceed without him. Um, <clears throat> I'll mention briefly meeting logistics. Um, anyone who's participating by uh, by Zoom or remotely, we would ask you to indicate your full name on your on your screen so we can we know who who we're talking to and who's talking to us. Anyone who wishes to address the council, please uh, raise your virtual hand on your Zoom screen and. Uh, Keep your comments or questions under three minutes. Anyone who wishes to speak must be recognized by the mayor. And once you're called upon, you may make a statement or ask questions, but not in a way that is a dialogue. Just make all your points at one time, and then we'll uh, we'll take them up as we uh, as we can. Um, and uh, our uh, we will have assistance from Ms. Prim on uh, on keeping time for uh, speakers. And with that, I'll ask the uh, council if there are any changes uh, to the agenda requested. Okay, we will proceed uh, with the approved agenda. Next item is for general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And in accordance with our uh, rules of procedure, we would ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. And I will start with uh, with Jim Adkison, who's, uh, who's joining us remotely. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great, thank you. I have a little speech here I'd like to read. I'd like to make the statement that I don't condone any violence against anyone for the color of their skin, their faith or nationality. I hope that every group can enjoy the right to live in a world free from violence. Every group has its strengths and weaknesses and should be proud to be unique in their own way. Asians, Hispanics, blacks and whites all have a culture while different are equally valid. Pride in one's own race and that does not imply contempt for other races is also a normal and healthy sentiment. I wanna talk about the rise in violence against white people it's not as hidden as it once was, and we're all seeing a spike in terror against people for the simple fact that they are white. I can't stay quiet any longer. Every day I scroll through X and YouTube to see countless videos of whites being stabbed, shot, and beaten by hordes of non-whites. I read news articles describing sexual assaults against our women and children. I read about stabbings in subways. I see videos of innocent whites being murdered day after day, and it has to end. I want things to peacefully to be settled. It's not just happening occasionally, it's happening every day in our country. Just think about how white people feel seeing our people being abused, but we're called Nazis for demanding to it, for it to end. I'll take the label of Nazi if it means I love my people enough to stand against the genocide being perpetrated against us. For years, we've stayed quiet, letting the blood of our people be spilled without any opposition, but it must end now. We need an organization for whites to unite under to defend our people and for future. One place you can learn more at is gtbflyers.com. Watch Defiant by Devon Stack in Europa, The Last Battle at gtdflyers.com. I want to tell the story of Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom of Knoxville, Tennessee. They were a happy white couple in their early 20s. They were murdered on January 6, 2007. The horror started when they were carjacked and taken to a rental house. Both were raped, tortured, and ultimately murdered. Shannon died after hours of sexual torture. She sustained a severe head injury and had bleach poured down her throat and had her body scrubbed to remove DNA evidence. Christopher was raped by a minimum of one perpetrator. He was then taken to a set of railroad tracks where he was forced to walk barefoot to the location where he was murdered. He was blindfolded with a bandana and gagged with a sock. He wore only a shirt and underwear. After his murders, after his murder, they kidnapped and set Christopher's body on fire. The criminals were, you guess it, four black men and a black female. Diversity means fewer white people. Inclusion means excluding white people. And equity means stealing from white people. Why do we have DIE programs when the Supreme Court has ruled that practices of favoring people over race is illegal discrimination? Why do non-whites get special housing programs? Why can non-whites get social safety nets, but we get scraps? 
Are whites living in rural Appalachia struggling for food privilege? Is it a privilege to foot the bill to import those that hate our very existence? Is it privilege for our children to be groomed? Is it privilege to be murdered in our own homes? We talk about progress in our diversified society, but is it progress to let two mentally ill men get married or for a woman to kill our unborn baby? Is it progress for a white woman to be a single mother for life with multiple mud babies of different imprisoned black fathers? I don't think this is progress. Thank you. Sir, before you log off, if you do, could you uh, state where you live? We all don't usually, uh, we usually ask that for of our speakers. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to be uh, be recognized? I'm sorry, folks, I did not realize that we'd be subjected to the uh, level of uh, racist and hate speech that we just heard, but it's a public forum. Okay. We, uh, I'm seeing no other uh, people asking to be heard. We can move to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda or any requests to remove anything from the consent agenda? No minutes. Right. Will the liquor licenses have to discuss? Sure. Okay. Would someone move uh, the consent agenda except for item F? So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor? Yes. Quickly note on these um, that oh, they're all set to be voted. I just want to make sure we were clear that uh, one of the conditions for the uh, corporate cup is that we will be is that they'll be paying the city's costs, uh, and that we have another request for which the city will be incurring costs, uh, but we're not because we don't really have a set policy. Uh, we won't be assessing those costs, but we. We will be, I guess I just want to point this out that given the budget discussion, I mean, we will be bringing forward a policy that for you to consider whether or not we should be assessing, you know, whether it's the overtime or creating signs or whatever it takes to do these types of events, because typically we have not charged for those, but it was an issue during budget times. So I just wanted to flag that. That's nothing about these votes, but just so people understood that. Thanks, Bill. I did have a brief discussion with the previous uh, sergeant at arms about the uh, the costs of uh, providing security to the uh, state of the state address. And so mm -hmm. it's just what, we, what we're, we're faced with these days. Any other discussion? Are we ready to vote? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Liquor licenses, Tim. Questions. Um, one of these in the list was Charlie O's outdoor venue. Um, and having had the joy of living downtown and right above it last summer, um, are there any sound restrictions or noise limits associated with that permit? So there are there is a noise ordinance about that, that really focuses on decibels. Uh, it doesn't focus on sort of crowd noise. Um, so I don't know that I, I don't know if they have outdoor they have, they, beyond they 10 have live music after 10. I don't. I think it's either nine or 10 is okay. their cutoff. Um, I do know when they initially sought a license for that space, there was a discussion about whether to put a time limit on it. And the council at that time voted to allow them to go, you know, whatever they're legally allowed to go to. But um, we can, we, you know, so we have not imposed any regulations other than our normal noise ordinance and uh, the restrictions on the ampl outdoor amplified music beyond, it's either nine or 10 o'clock, I can't remember, I'd have to look. So we can get more information on that. Yes, I'm not trying to hold them back, but I, I think probably because there are also people that live downtown and it's um, it's a factor. Maybe if there is a time limit, if we could, Confirm that and enforce it, or at least let yeah, them know that it's. I can um, probably look it up while we're. Talking. But I'm not looking to hold them up beyond. Do you want to uh, take some time looking at whether uh, we should um, amend that ordinance? Bill's going to 
get us some information. But if you want to pursue that, you certainly you mean put it on tonight a, or just yeah. If you want to uh, put it put a discussion on a future agenda to discuss what the ordinance should be, be fine with that. Well, I'm assuming though for their license, we should probably vote to approve it. But yeah, with an awareness that it's a little different issue than associated with most licenses. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Uh, Weiss. Yes, I Why don't you step up? Uh, so, Thomas Weiss, District 2, resident of Montpelier. I would appreciate it if you all would remember that you're not speaking just to the person you're speaking to, but to all of us back here as well. So, raise the voices a little bit, please. Thanks for the reminder. All right. So, is there a motion to approve uh, item F from the consent agenda? Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. We're now up to zoning public hearing, and I will, uh, while Mike's getting setting, set up, I will open the public hearing. All right. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, Mike Miller. I'm the Planning Director for the City of Montpelier, and this is the fourth public hearing on the zoning amendments that have been proposed. Uh, I don't have any presentation um, other than just to say we haven't made any changes since the ones you made at the last meeting, and we will. I'll take whatever questions um, that anyone has. Okay, since this is a public hearing, I'll look to the room to see if there's anyone who wants to make a comment. Mr. Weiss, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, if I remember correctly, at the last meeting at which this was discussed, uh, did I mention my name, Thomas Weiss, just for the record again? Um, it was left that there was going to be some consideration among the energy committee on the solar access portion. And I'd like to know what happened with that, even though nothing has changed since that last meeting. Thank you. Do you? I did not attend uh, another MEAC meeting. I don't know if there was one. Lauren. I believe there was a meeting, but both Sal and I had conflicts, so we weren't able to attend and never got an update from MIAC. So there's no, unfortunately, new feedback to provide. Okay. Looking for any other comments from members of the public, either in the room or on, uh, on Zoom. And I'm not seeing any, but I will pause briefly to give anyone who wants to speak a chance to get their hand up. Okay, seeing no comments from the public, I will close the public hearing. And do we have discussion from the council? Jim? In terms of how you see this progressing, um, is there some big changes in here? Urban residential being one. Yes. And as you know, I don't think that's big enough. It's not, it, I think just doing it for one property, um, I still don't feel it's the right approach, but that's what we're doing to get the Country Club Road piece going. But I'd like to hear some thoughts about how, how it could progress after this um, to look at other properties around it and other potential places in town that to expand that zone too, if we really value creating more housing. Yeah, I mean, I think from a from a process standpoint, we're gonna have a couple opportunities with the certainly with the city plan update that's gonna be going on for the next over the next 12 months. We're gonna be working on having some broader conversations about um kind of more general, those 50,000 foot discussions of where we want to have additional development happen. And that could be, as I said, this this district could really work in a place maybe like the National Life area, but we haven't approached them. And I, I don't really like to generally just go and rezone somebody's property without having them either initiating it or 
working with us to go through and say, yeah, that's mm -hmm. part of our vision for this property. Um, so I think there are other changes we could be making going forward. Um, but at this time, I mean, taking an incremental approach, um, my office has very much since we made the the changes in 2018, really work on every year coming back and, and trying to make those incremental changes um, so we can get opportunities to look at each piece um, in detail and not to have a lot. Uh, actually, I think the last one that came in had like 14 zoning changes that were in it. Um, and that kind of felt like a lot for people to absorb and discuss, um, but they were all good changes. There are a lot of small changes, but I think taking them a couple at a time is good. It gives the public a chance to kind of wrap their head around what's being discussed, what the opportunities are, and we can make votes on each one. Um, but I do think there are opportunities to make other, other adjustments, uh, but uh, immediately around this area, I don't think there are good ones um, just because of the terrain and just because of the, the existing land uses. I don't think we're going to be talking about to the east is uh, a lot of the industrial areas. I don't see that we're going to be adjusting any of those. And to the little bit to the south and west is, is a lot of wetlands and we get onto the roundabout in 302 and I don't know it's really appropriate there. So it's it's kind of in this piece a fairly unique location uh, for this new zoning district. Uh, we talked briefly about whether Sabin's pasture would be appropriate, but we've kind of steered away from that because it had received a lot of conversation and a lot of debate during the 2018 adjustment. And the public had a lot of input on that one about trying to make sure it was consistent with the riverfront district, um, which is Berry Street, and not to have it that much different. So they very carefully carved out, planning commission had made a couple of uh, potential proposals and council kind of had their own idea, which was to make those 10 acres riverfront and the rest rural. So that's the way that has kind of worked out, but it could certainly over time be something that could be reconsidered as well. I think it needs to be. I really do. It's somewhere in our zoning process, we've lost track of highest and best use for properties to use them to create housing, which this community really needs. And that process, unfortunately, feeds the NIMBY uh, mm -hmm. mentality. And when you're cutting a 96-acre property or whatever that is down to 10 usable acres, which there's way more than 10 usable acres there, um, I think we need to look at it in this process. Um, and I would rather had it be part of this process and not waiting to go through a prolonged city plan. Yeah. And it may come up again as we're talking about, you know, we're talking about connecting a road through and we're talking about a TIF district. These are going to have to come back up again as as we're having those conversations, because we're going to obviously put uh, city infrastructure through to connect these properties. There's going to have to be a discussion of how that's going to be impacted by the the land use. You know, we're not going to want rural zoning through that area if we're going to be spending money putting infrastructure through that area as well. So you are assuming there'll be a road back through a Sorcy Goldman to get from the Country Club Road? It's been somewhat of a of an assumption we're going to we're at least going to have to have the conversation because of fire access we're going to want to have two accesses to get in and out of that property if we're going to have 500 housing units it just mm -hmm. is the appropriate thing certainly to have that conversation um other conversations does that connect to college street does that connect to town hill those are i think are separate conversations but there should certainly at least be a conversation of looping those roads around so that way both of those properties have two accesses um, for emergency services. You know, Tim, I don't want to tell you what to do, but uh, the ordinance is before us now, and yeah. uh, it would be in order to move to amend if there's some if there's an amendment you'd like to propose. And I'm not ready to. I'm Try, but this it doesn't seem like other counselors have had interest in going into some of these options either. So it, it really just seems like this ordinance that's proposed is what's rolling down the tracks. Well, but I, I my sense of the discussion is that people are people in general have been pretty interested in your idea of expanding consideration of of this zoning district to 
other parts of the city. And so whatever we do tonight, I don't think that conversation is going away. Right. So I, I certainly hope not, because I agree with you that we we need more housing and that probably involves rezoning other parts of the city too. It is. Okay. Adrian. Question. Um, so we say the word we need to have a lot more housing. And even in the strategic plan, we say we need to increase housing. And so I would love to understand a little bit more. I love Tim's idea, but what does more housing mean in terms of a number? What is the number we're trying to achieve? And does this zoning amendments help us achieve that? So I'd like to tie it back to some data and some goals that we can measure to understand um, where are we now in terms of our housing opportunities? Where can we go in terms of the number of increased housing? And does this zoning help us get there? Um, I'd like to see that tied together a little bit more clearly because I, I agree with Tim. I just don't see the connection in terms of, you know, the more housing, the TIF district, you know, high density and how this relates. And so, I mean, I'm not a zoning expert, but I'd love to have more clarity around what that looks like so I can make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. Do you have a response to that, Mike? Yeah, I can. And we're going to have um, a larger discussion of this later on in the meeting when we talk about the housing, uh, the housing strategy as well. The zoning regulations are one piece. Um, and I, I can get into this again a little bit later, but I can also talk about it now. Uh, zoning is more often than not a, a, a barrier to development. It prevents things from happening. So we can adjust our zoning, and we have adjusted our zoning, to allow development to happen. Um, it is no longer a barrier to a lot of development happening in town. Uh, a lot of smaller projects, obviously larger projects may need some zoning changes. But in general, our the barriers to zoning have been mostly removed. But that doesn't change the economics of housing, and it doesn't change um, who owns the property. Um, uh, obviously, you could have you could have no zoning. Um, um, Worcester, uh, I don't think Williamstown, uh, there are a number of communities in the area that don't have any zoning and they still have a housing problem. So it's not just just zoning, it's it's a development problem with the cost of constructions and who owns the land and who wants to develop and those types of, of barriers. And so there's another set of what we call programs and projects that we can do to help facilitate housing happening. On the question of numbers, what we have used is, um, so there's a, a general metric that says you usually want to have about 5% in rent, rental markets, about 5% vacancy. We've been at about 0% vacancy. So if you were to do the math, that would come out to about 240 housing units. But that assumes we're not in a deficit, which we probably are. But assuming we aren't in a deficit, we would need about 240 housing units and that's what our city plan talks about as our target, 240 housing units over eight years. That's where that number comes from. Uh, wasn't just drawn out of a hat. The question is whether that's that would be enough to actually make uh, a difference. We'll, we will have to see, and it'll take time to see how that, that plays out. But the first piece we had to do um, is to adjust the zoning so we had infill potential, and we now have infill potential in... Um, nearly every building lot. And if this goes through, every building lot would have some infill potential. Uh, that doesn't force anyone to do anything, and it doesn't mean that the economics are there to make it happen. That's where we have to start talking about programs. How can we help, uh, whether it's uh, the state has it like a VHIP program that helps put in accessory apartments, um, uh, tax stabilizations um, to help offset some of the tax burdens. Uh, we're going to have a discussion later on in this meeting about development agreements, another way that the city could get involved to help defray some of those costs, bend some of those cost curves to allow housing to happen. But our target is um, about 240 housing units is what we are we are talking about. And we don't 
think that's going to necessarily fix the problem, but that is our first big step in that direction. Um, and just by way of measure, we had about 140 housing units gained, net gain, between the 2010 and the 2020 census. So obviously, even building 140 housing units is not really keeping up with the with the development pressure that exists for in the demand for more rental housing units. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Adrian, another way that I think about this, you know, I, having been advocating for housing for many years, my personal feeling is that if if the, we were to develop the Montpelier population of Montpelier to 10,000 people, I think we could do that and it wouldn't uh, do any violence to our uh, experience of what it is to live in Montpelier. It wouldn't uh, over uh, overburden our infrastructure. And of course, it requires a good bit of housing to uh, to get there. But if we're looking at three or 400 units um, on Country Club Road, does that get us closer to where we'd like to be? I, I think it's a significant uh, contribution to that. If I could just weigh in on that too quickly. We did do an economic study. It's dated now, but I don't think it really changes the... I think the facts are still pretty relevant. It was about how basically how much growth can we afford with our services? And it was it was similar to what Jack said. About a two thousand people could be absorbed with our combination of additional revenues and the police fire, public works infrastructure that we have. you know, sort of beyond that, we would then need to think about spending more. Um, and of course, uh, un, under today's uh, school system, also the the, the greater number of students is a financial benefit on this, the school side. Uh, and around the time that that happened, which would have been around 2010, I'm guessing, um, the council at that point set a goal of 500 new housing units. So if 140 have come by, then I guess we have 360 to go, right? So, uh, so, so I think that there's your range, 240 to 360, you, you know, when, uh, those, those are, and and ultimately, you are talking about a housing goal tonight, so you all can set a goal if you want to, and put a number on. Tim, relative to this, Adrian's question, I, I think what's interesting is the what we're doing is creating like another layer or more layers in our zoning code, and as much as um, Mike said that you know the, the zoning code is now in line and doesn't stop housing from happening. The reality is that the reason we're doing this tonight is because the zoning we have will not allow the housing we want on the Country Club Road property. And we're having to amend our zoning, basically create a variance to allow it to happen there. When Mike talked about the Zorzi Goldman property a few minutes ago, same kind of comments. It was like limited down to really 10 acres and the less Russ was left rural. Again, we zoned it so we can't build on it. Um, so our zoning code isn't that friendly for housing, and I think it needs a lot of work. Um, and that's why I'm just, you say, you know, it's different times when we've talked, like with Bill, it's like, you know, show me where it's not working. And I think Country Club Road is probably the biggest example of that. You know, yes. And in all fairness, it had been a golf course. And so it was zoned, what is it? Right. It was zoned rural because it at the time it did not have access to sewer and water. Right. So, so it was, a, it was it, zoned for its use as a golf yeah. course. So I think, you know, I mean, it needed to be changed to something anyway mm. once it was no longer a golf course. I think it had been zoned based on its prior use. Sabins, I think, is a fair, you know, comment. There was a lot of community discussion and people wanted part of that preserved and part of it developed. And yep. what is in the zoning represented the outcome of many years of community conversation. And if we want to reopen that conversation, I'm sure we'll have a robust discussion and we end will. up where we end up, but that's, you know, that's yes. how it works. It's, you know, I understand. <laughs> yeah. The city, the, the planning commission had, had proposed in 2017 to have all of it zoned residential 6,000, which would have made it consistent with um, the college street neighborhood. And it was the council that, made the compromise to kind of adjust it and make high density in the lower area and lo and lower density in the other area. So 
Um, certainly, there uh, there are people on all sides, planning commission, planning department, who who favored other and other alternatives. Uh, but we also supported the fact that at that time we really wanted to get that um, those bylaws through, and um, that was the compromise that needed to be made at that time to make that happen. Palin. Are there uh, any towns we can check and compare what they do about their zoning? Like, is it better to have more flexible zoning codes or something like what we do or we don't have anything to look at? I'm not talking about this uh, hearing. I'm talking about for the future discussion because um, it might affect um economic development and also housing, so many things. So if we start uh, discussing these things, we need to look at other numbers, right, uh, which is better. And I know that every decision has like positive and negative impacts, uh, but as a council, we are trying to make the uh, best um, option for the future, right? So can we add an agenda item? I, I know we are talking about housing tonight, but maybe in other strategic planning. So are they any towns doing something different and creating more positive impact on housing, like similar town like us? So I have a couple of observations. One is we are going to be talking on a broader policy basis in like two agenda items about, so my, maybe we you know, should resolve our what's before us and then have that conversation about where we want to go. Uh, secondly, I'm just going to observe, I'm not a zoning expert and I, you know, Mike can jump in here, but the housing shortage is a statewide issue. So again, to the extent that zoning is stopping housing, I mean, it's happening everywhere. So regardless of people's zoning and you're seeing municipalities all over the state trying to do what we're doing. And I would say, you know, I think there's philosophical questions about what the best way to do it is. But for example, last year, the state mandated uh, many changes in local zoning to try to create more housing. And our, our zoning already had them virtually all in. So they were they were trying to get the rest of the state to a standard where we were already at. Um, so I think, you know, we are, I, I mean, I know our planning commission and our council have been pushing or more housing friendly? Could it be friendlier? Could it be easier? But, you know, uh, maybe. And, um, you know, and I think as Mike has pointed out, there's a trade-off between um, process. So if, if the vaguer you make it, the more it requires going to boards to interpret. The more specific you make it, the more it can have administrative approvals and someone can walk into the office and, and get an approval. So, it, you know, it's, it's all trade-offs. So I would, I'd suggest that, you deal with the zoning that's in front of you now. And then in just a minute, we're going to talk about how we'd like to spend our time talking about zoning and proponing housing over the course of the year. Other towns are looking at our zoning codes, yeah, right? Well, <laughs> I, yeah, From I, your example, which, which I is- I can't say that other towns are looking yeah. at ours. What I can say is the state imposed zoning standards on the entire state to try to create more housing. And we almost entirely already met them. Uh, so we had very little change to make, whereas others then had to drastically change their zoning to make it more housing friendly. So that's what I can say. I don't know who's looking at ours. Adrian. I'll just give a, a an example. So when I looked at the zoning, you know, it's 200 pages. It's a lot of information. And so I, for my own comfort level, had to make it into a real life scenario. So just to share this example, one of my neighbors on Jordan and Clarendon has two houses with a, um, like a, I guess another parcel of land. I don't know all the technical terms, um, but he has been prohibited to build on that land due to our restrictive zoning policies over the past couple of years. So I had him look at the updated changes. He talked to the planning department and based on the updated changes and the reduction of um, requirements, he is now able to, to build on that property, which provides more infill for our city, more housing. I mean, it's not 300 units, but I think if we can look at more opportunities of lands that exist within our neighborhoods and promote these zoning policies, that we might potentially have quick, easy ways to build additional buildings. Um, so that is something that is 
brings this to life as an example um, that I'm excited about. So thank you for making those changes for my neighbor who can now build a house that will bring in more um, people. In fact, if, if he can build a house, it doesn't have to be a single family house. That's, the whole, <laughs> right. that's what you want to play. We're multiple apartments. Yep. yep. Great. So. Uh, Carrie. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I think we have really good questions raised here. And um, I, I think that we're, in general, we're trying to be housing friendly. I think we're all really on the same page if we want more housing. Uh, the Planning Commission is very much on that page as well, as is our planning director. And um, and in terms of kind of looking to other communities for examples of how things are done, uh, I know that that has been part of the process that the planning commission has gone through and that the planning director does all the time, that they're not coming up with these as you know their own original ideas that they just have no reason to think might work. So, so I feel pretty confident. Um, and also as, as uh, the mayor was pointing out, they, or as the manager was pointing out, I'm sorry, there were there are things coming down from the state where there are also people who have been looking at best practices in other communities, not just around the state, but around the country. And so I, th I think it's we can rely on when people tell us that these are best practices. I think we can we can rely on that. And there are probably um, lots of other changes that we can make. And one of the things that the Housing Committee is starting to work on is getting more into the details of where are the challenges that people in Montpelier are facing and have been facing, like Adrian mentioned, and to try to get really clear about what kind of changes we can make. So I am, I would like to, you know, I, I like the ones that we have before us right now, but this is definitely not the end of the conversation. To me, it feels more like the beginning of the conversation. Thanks, Carrie. So here we are. I don't, there's maybe a lot more to say. I don't know, but here we are. We're at our fourth the hearing on this, uh, I think that we've discussed pretty comprehensively everything that everyone has wanted to discuss on this uh, set of proposals. And I can't tell anybody in the room what to do, but it does seem like it would be an appropriate time for someone to move to, uh, to approve these and we'll decide whether that passes or not. Lauren. Um, I move we adopt the, uh, what's the right name of it? The amendments to the Unified Development Regulations um, using the April 3rd draft as presented. Is there a second? All right, is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we'll do a roll call. Uh, Hurl. Aye. Hong. Aye. Uh, Heaney. Uh, Brown. Aye. Gill. Aye. We have adopted the ordinance. Now, the way it works is that uh, this doesn't go into effect right away. Is that right, Mike? I know it's a complicated state complicated. law is very weird when it comes to this. Technically, it does not go into effect for 15 days, but it actually also goes into effect uh, as soon as it's warned. So, technically, <laughs> they have very complicated state laws that we really wish they would fix. But uh, they they basically have been in effect. Um, once you warn a hearing, both regulations are in effect at the same time, so you can only get approved. If both, if it meets both sets of regulations are current and are proposed. Now that it has passed, there's a 15 day window where they will both still be in effect until the 15th day when only the new ones will be in effect. Thank you, Mike. And don't go anywhere because you're up next with flood hazard amendments. Mike's up all night. I'm yep. up I'm, I'm pretty much getting nice and comfy here. <laughs> all right. Um, so this next hearing, um, this next is, isn't a hearing. This is just an introduction to an emergency emergency set of interim changes to the river hazard regulations. Now, um, most of you were all here. Maybe I don't know if Adrian was here for the adoption of the river hazard regs, but we just did this a couple weeks ago, and uh, something um, 
came up that I felt was sufficient enough that we should warn an emergency hearing for us to dis to have a discussion about uh, changes of use for certain projects. So it turns out there's a loophole in our regulations that I wasn't aware of, or I would have probably mentioned it during our um, process. And what it is, is that if you have a non-conforming commercial building that is, and by non-conforming, it means it doesn't meet the rules, but it's legal, uh, and that space is below the base flood elevation, you are technically allowed to convert that space, that commercial space, into residential living space. Um, if you were building new, that would never be allowed. If you were uh, doing an addition, that would never be allowed. But because of a technical loophole in our regulations, you actually can take commercial space and convert it into residential space. Um, at the same time, um, Bill and I and uh, a number of folks are working really hard at the state house to get money to elevate 12 buildings in our downtown. We had 12 residential buildings, uh, which total about 20 units where flooding happened into the first floor of those residential units. So people were displaced. You've probably heard a lot about it. You've met some of them. They were displaced from their houses, and they're going to be displaced for many years as a result of it. So our our goal is to get funding to elevate those buildings so nobody, if we get another flood like last June, nobody is displaced. We don't have to find places, and we don't have to count on FEMA to find places for people to live. That's the goal. Um, so that that's our goal on one side, and then on the other side, what I didn't realize with the loophole until somebody actually came in and pulled permits for, we had two permits pulled to convert commercial space into new residential space. So while I'm working on this end to get all these buildings elevated, I've got people behind me who are putting new spaces in below base flood elevation. Point out, perfectly legal, 100% legal. The question is, and the reason why I warned this as an emergency amendment is that I wanted to make sure Council had an opportunity to discuss because we also have three more people who are asking to do the same thing. That'll be five new buildings below base flood elevation with multiple units. And so we can, and I, the proposal that will be on the table for you in two weeks is to prohibit that type of construction. If you want to convert commercial space that's below base flood elevation to residential, you have to elevate it. You can't put new residential space. We can't have new new people going in below base flood elevation. That's my recommendation. That's why I wanted to warn it was because once it gets warned, it goes into effect, just like we mentioned with the zoning. This weird quirk of state law, once you warn it, it does go into effect. And so by warning this, we have um, a two-week window, three-week window for us to have a conversation of what do we want as the policy? And if council says that's okay, we vote down the amendment, those projects move forward. If council says we like it, or we like it with this amendment, or we want it with these changes, we can have that conversation. This gives us a period of time of a couple of weeks to have that conversation of what we would like to see going forward. But um, from my standpoint, I was concerned enough, I felt we should warn at least an emergency provision to get that that stay, that hold put in place. So Mike, for a, <clears throat> for a first question, is this, a public hearing that, since you said you warned the amendment, sh should this be tre treated and opened as a public hearing? Uh, if this is going to fall under an, an interim emergency, so the interim hearing is actually warned because it has to be warned 15 days in advance. It's actually warned for the 17th. Obviously, if you want to take public comment now, you can. Um, that's certainly an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but from a legal standpoint, the public hearing is not until the 17th. There's only a requirement for one public hearing for an interim change because interim changes can only go into effect for two, a period of two years. Um, you have those two years to then go through and do a full adoption process, whereas a public hearing process, public hearings at the planning commission level before being forwarded to you for consideration. And this is also just a plain ordinance, not a zoning regulation right? uh river hazard follows the same rules as, oh, okay. as zoning okay but it does fall under slightly different because it's an interim change not a full adoption change okay so just to help with that the the basically 
the goal or the um, the decision for you tonight is you can say, yep, we want to continue talking about this, and then we will hold the emergency public hearing on April 17th and then whatever. Or you could say, we, we, we don't want to do anything else with it, which case we would cancel that public hearing and things would just stay the way they were, or you could provide some other direction. So this is sort of, here's a topic. It came up. We're bringing this to your attention. How do you want to proceed with this? So that's, that's what this is about. Okay. Thanks. Anyway, Adrian, you're up first. Uh, so we're talking about commercial buildings being converted into residential space. So what, I just, um, you'll know that I'm a numbers person. That's how my brain works. So what is the number of potential um, units that could be impacted by this? So if I'm thinking of it correctly, I'm thinking about downtown. Those are all commercial. And in our zoning, they could turn to a residential unit that are all within the, the flood zone. I know you use the technical term, but. Like, is that if we don't change this, they could all turn to residential and still be within the flood zone? I, I don't, uh, there's certain, there's going to obviously be an economic, most people aren't going to shift yeah. um, a, a lot of their down valuable downtown space into um, residential, but there are going to be places on, say, Elm Street, where it's not on Main Street, where there may be places that fall into these other categories of, you know, maybe maybe this is one that will shift over because it, there's less foot traffic over on this street, but it's in the flood stage. And it doesn't prohibit, um, because we know, perfect example, Aubuchon's, uh, we did the French block project. This would not, this change would not affect the French block project because those units were above the base flood elevation. The building is in the floodplain and the first floor floods, that's, that's okay. The second floor did would not be flooded, so therefore that project is still fine. It's if you were to decide to take Obishans and convert it into apartments, then we would say, if this rule were were to pass as it was written, it would say no. You could well you can do that, but you have to elevate that first floor. Tim, think through what the implications of this would be. So we don't get someone in a in a bad situation too. And I do live on Main Street, and when I look around my house and, and any time, it's amazing how many buildings are still dark. There's nobody there. Um, and since the flood, it's over eight months, and uh, we haven't done anything to assist or contact or help these folks. But at some point, as they try to bring their properties back, a number of them have been used for commercial uses. And I I think in the market and the times we're in. There's a higher demand for and need for housing units and less for offices. So I expect you may see some of those wanting to change over. Um, and so I think we just need to consider all that as we look at this kind of policy change. Yeah, you mentioned Elm Street, but there are those uh, office spaces like right on the river on Main Street that, yeah, you know, there's carriage houses and stuff and... <clears throat> That would be a very attractive residential location, if not for the fact that uh, you're at risk of having your your home flooded. Yeah, one of them is already residential. That is on our list that we would like to elevate. That we're looking for for federal funding and state uh -huh. funding to elevate. So that's on, there's one on Main Street that is on the river and tucked in back. But Tim, the, your point, I think, is well taken. That if we if we decide we need to have a fuller discussion of it. This idea is we'll have it on the agenda for the 17th and we'll, uh, we'll do that. Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm glad you brought this to our attention. I mean, it's so hard. Like we were just minutes ago being like, there's a housing crisis. We desperately need housing, which we all agree with. And then it seems really challenging to be like, let's build housing that is putting property and at risk that later we might have to pay to elevate. So it seems like we should do it right the first time instead of creating something. And I don't know what that entails though. And like, are there, does this mean like those entire buildings have to be elevated? Are there like ways they could be built to meet standards with like aggressive disclosure or like, like, are there, is there some 
are there ways to do it? Or is it like, literally, these are other buildings that would have to be elevated for another couple hundred thousand in order to meet this? Um, they probably have to be elevated okay. because you can't drive floodproof or wet floodproof residential structures. Okay. There's really just elevating. Um, and, you know, and, and I think if, if our experience last June had been diff or July had been different, you know, I might look at this differently, but just knowing how, I guess, how badly the FEMA process was and has been for residents, I guess I'm extra hesitant about <laughs> going and having a disclosure statement or some other ways of saying, we, we certainly, there's nothing illegal about what we're doing right now, even as a city. We certainly, there's no NFIP obligation that says we have to require these to be elevated. Um, it's It would be something we would be doing because we're working to put ourselves in a position where if there's a hundred year flood event, um, obviously we can't guarantee anything if it goes above a hundred years, but if it's, we've got that hundred year mapped, we know because we just had a hundred year flood, there were 12 buildings that flooded then. So two questions, one, NFIP, National Flood Insurance Program. Yes, always, sorry. Always worth <laughs> remembering that not everybody I, I live in the vegetable soup that is FEMA. Yeah. The uh, the other thing is when you said that you can't dry or wet flood proof residential property, is that because there are some regulations that prohibit it or that it's just not, as a practical matter, it's not possible? Uh, it's it's not legal for, through the National Flood Insurance regulations to have those. So wet flood proof basically puts in floodgates that would allow the water to come in and allow the water to leave afterwards. It's used a lot in uh, industrial buildings and those types of things where there's, uh, you have to get hydrostatic, the water pressure. You don't want water pressure to build up on the side of a metal building because it doesn't have enough support. It'll just collapse in on itself. So you have these vents that allow water to go in and out. You, you can't allow that for a residential use. And dry flood proofing, uh, generally requires that you've got some type of device that keeps the water out, um, which is fine, again, for uh, certain certain things. We've been talking about that for the basement of this building, but nobody's asleep in this building. Uh, that's where we, that's where the NFIP codes and the flood codes kind of come in to go through and say, if you're sleeping, we don't want you in those types of situations because once um, those are breached, uh, they usually rapidly fill with water and certainly uh certainly in our environment ice jam environment you don't want to be waking up at two o'clock in the morning with 35 degree water in your house <laughs> any other comments from members of the council do you would you like a motion to go ahead with this or just kind of a general okay and uh palin i see you <laughs> to have two weeks like uh, put it item on the um, 17 agenda so it will give some time for public to read think about it and maybe they will come with other questions that we haven't mentioned so I just want to uh, take that away <laughs> and just to be clear procedurally um, the, the hearing for the 17th has been warned so the only action you would need to take was be if you did not want that. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't do anything, then the hearing will occur. If, if you choose, if you took an affirmative vote not to have it, then that would end that process. Okay. I'm curious to see if there are any members of the public, either in the room or uh, online, who would like to be heard on this topic. This is not the public hearing, but uh, always interested in hearing what people have to say. Not seeing anybody. Okay. I think we're set on that. Thank you. Okay. But I know, well, next up. No, I get, I get to actually move out, take Okay. two-minute break and five-minute break. And uh, the short, housing committee comment. Short-term rental uh, ordinance. Hi. How are you all? Good. 
Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome, Rebecca Copans. For the record, I am representing the Popular Housing Committee today, um, and um, I'm bringing to you, bringing back to you, the short-term rental uh, proposal that we um, presented. It, I'm not even sure how long ago. It feels like years. <laughs> this one for this. It was um, months ago. Yeah, a long time. Um, and I can do two things. I can run through high level, um, or I can give you um, just a like a three sentence um, and what we'd love to see as the amendments in the policy before you. What's your preference? Why don't we go at a kind of a high level? It's more yeah. than three sentences, but Great. it's a substantive thing. And, and this, this is the first reading of the ordinance, although, Bill, I heard you saying that something might not be the first reading. Uh, it was warned as a first reading. I think what I had heard is that the Housing Committee maybe wanted some changes or work. You know, I, so I think whatever you all want to do, it was warned as a first reading. Okay. You can amend it for a second reading. You can have a third read. You know, we can have I another really first reading. <laughs> have as many readings as you like. So okay. within, have, have at least two. Okay, Rebecca, you're on. Sure. Um, so we, uh, I think the confusion li lay, lies lay in the in the fact that there it's not in ordinance form, um, so we didn't have something to mark up. So I can give you um, just a high level of uh, what our intent is, and then as I'm going through, I can give you the there's three uh, amendments that I would like to propose. Um, so just to give you a a reminder. The housing committee was created to um, increase the availability of long-term housing in, in Montpelier. Um, and one of the low-hanging fruit pieces of housing is looking at what is currently available that's not being used as, as long-term housing. And squarely in that camp is um, is folks who, who buy a house and then turn it into a short-term rental. Um, Montpelier has authority um, under Vermont state statute to regulate short-term rentals. Um, we define, um, the, I'll just go through some definitions. Owner occupied uh, means a primary dwelling um, or the residence of the pri of the property owner. Um, that, I'm sorry, the, the primary red dwelling unit or residence the property owner claims on the Vermont homestead declaration or the primary residence of a short-term rental operator, which gets into um, the tenants that the the city attorney suggested that we add um, to make sure we're inclusive of all. Um, this is where I would recommend our first amendment um, by striking or manager authorized by the property owner to act on their behalf, because this takes a sharp left turn away from the intent, which is, you know, we are fully um, in favor of people who live in their homes and they rent it out from time to time to um, support their um pay for their taxes or, or pay for their trip to Montreal or whatever they want to do as, as additional income. Um, we don't want people who are investors to buy a property and, and then rent it. So by striking manager authorized by the property owner to act on their behalf, it, it comes back to the intent of the committee. Um, the definition of a short-term rental is something that's uh, rented to guests for less than 30 days. Um, and then over a 12 month 12 month period it's more than 14 days. So if you if if someone rents to their house for one weekend a year that's not considered a short term rental. If someone rents their house to a legislator for 4 months that is also not a short term rental. This is, you know, a weekend or a week um, at a time a rental that's you know in the very short term. Um it can be a partial dwelling unit so you could rent a room in your house or it can be a whole unit. Um it ex it specifically excludes motels, hotels, bed and breakfasts, group homes, sober living houses, schools, hospitals, and similar facilities. Um, the allowed short-term rentals, uh, so the, the second amendment, I would, in that first sentence, I would strike and and replace it with or. So short-term rentals shall be restricted to partial dwelling units or one whole dwelling unit. Um, it was just a draft, uh, an error in in writing and it's consistent with the rest of the uh the document um the third and the really chunky amendment is in the next paragraph um so owner occupancy of the subject property shall be evidenced by uh uh homestead declaration or um 
the certification from the short term oper the short term rental operator attesting and certifying under penalties of perjury that they um, that the subject property is their primary residence. And there's a definition in state statute of what primary residence is. I would then strike the remainder of that paragraph, which goes down the other path of allowing someone to buy a property, live elsewhere, and rent it. Um, so I would strike from if the short-term rental is not located on the same property all the way to the end of that paragraph. Um, this ordinance would ask that people register um, within with the city. Um, they would pay a fee of $110 a, a year, um, and they would give a certain amount of, of information. Um, and I, I'm, tell me if you want more detail, but you, I'm sure you can, you probably want to go faster than shorter. Um, and then every year we want to collect data to say who's, you know, who's using the short-term rentals, how often are they renting them? Um, you know, what was the total number of days? Are they really to get at, you know, uh, the taxes and the the income to the city and those kinds of things? Um and then it, it also gives the city more information about, do you want to regulate further? Do you want to change the regulation? It gives you more information to um, to amend in the future. Um, and then a key piece is compliance with um, additional safety requirements. Um, as we were doing this research, there's there are long-term rental safety requirements that are not applicable to short-term rentals necessarily. Um, and we believe that it's really important to have consistent safety regulations across all uh, places that are rented. Um, enforcement is another big piece. Um, it would be, uh, there would be an enforcement that would be similar to a parking ticket with heavier fines. Um, so there's a, you can see the list of, of civil penalties for a first offense through fifth offense, and it gets bigger as you go um, from $160 to $800. The intent is to, just dissuade people from being, you know, stay working outside of the the ordinance um, is is pretty clear, um, and that's the large and the long and the short of it. Any questions? No. Yeah, Pavan. Thank you uh, for a short but very good presentation. Um, I received some question how this uh, will affect Airbnb. So some people ask, oh, is it, does it mean banning Airbnb or uh, how much impact on uh, that? So if you clarify sure. uh, that question, it would be great. Thank you. Yes. Um, so if you live in your house and you rent it out, so you, um, if it's, if it's your primary residence and you rent it, rent it out to an Airbnb, that would be totally legal and um, under this ordinance. If you buy a house, you know, three streets down um, and you rent it out as an Airbnb, it would disallow that activity. So you have to live in your house. It has to, to be your primary residence, yeah. Mm -hmm. Adrian. Um, thanks. It's good to see you. Nice um, so just thinking about the problem we're trying to solve here. And so is there, so how many houses in Montpelier are bought and turned into rentals? Like is, do we have a number in terms of like, you know, like I know nationally, like when you go to New York City or Montreal, they investors buy entire buildings and turn them into rental units. Like that is a thing that happens. And so is that, is, is that happening here in Montpelier? And if it is, you know, what are the numbers, like how many houses are impacted by that? And if it's, if it hasn't happened yet, is this something to like, as a, like to prevent it from happening? Is that what the thought process is? Like, I guess there's a couple of questions in there, but yeah. So um, the first part is it's really complicated because the data changes day by day. It's not broken into, um, you know, there's, there are websites called AirDNA that, that can give you, um, kind of a, a snapshot of what the Airbnbs are for that time period, but it doesn't tell you what's owner occupied and what is uh, investor owned. Um, and so that's where the registration and data collection comes in. Um, so, you know, if we look on one day, we looked, it was 87, another day it was 140, I think. Um, 
sorry, <laughs> my phone a friend in the back of the room. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it, and then, so it's just, it's unknown. And so you, um, it's something that we really, we really wrestled with that, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we, how do we know unless we collect the data? And the only way to collect the data is to mandate that we collect the data. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second question is, so um, in Burlington, um, Business Insider named Burlington as the best place to invest in short-term rentals because people were buying up, just as you said, they're buying up oh. houses. Um, Burlington passed their ordinance oh. and they were struck from the list um, almost immediately. So when you pass an ordinance that says this this community is for long, for for residents, um, and the intent is to preserve the house housing for uh, for residents or for people to live here, rent or own. Um, it sends a message to invest investors that they should look elsewhere. Um, you look at, you know, there are some communities. Uh, Stowe, for example, seventy percent of their properties are uh, are not primary residences. So, if you look, it's both. Um, we don't want it to happen. It, it's it's happening. We don't know how much it's happening. We don't want it ha to happen more. Um, we have such a shortage of houses that uh, we we want to stop the bleeding. One more question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so for the hundred and ten dollar annual fee, how will that be enforced, and how will you work to collect that fee from these people? Mm -hmm. Um, so we have batted around some different ideas. Um, it could be in the planning department. It could be a volunteer committee of the housing committee, um, you know, to to look at the enforcement piece. Burlington hires a firm um, that they do the enforcement. They they scrape the um, they use a service to scrape the um, all the websites. So VRBO, Airbnb. Um, if you register in Burlington, you have to put a um, registration number on your um, your ad, um, which then can be tracked to the um, to the registration of, you know, of the city. Um, because Montpelier is so small, you know, we we could do it as a, you know, a rotating volunteer job um, to check that registration. Um, if it gets to the place of, you know, a really big business, so we could talk about, you know, someone from City Hall uh, as an, as a, a job. And if also looking at, you know, what, what the income is, if it, if it warrants, um, warrants spending, making more of an investment as, as a city employee. Okay, thanks. thanks. Uh, so we talk about if you buy a house and use it Airbnb and you don't live in it, this ordinance says, no, you cannot do this. And we don't have enough uh, hotels or inns in Montpelier to attract like tourists, um, people like especially that uh, leave season, right? So people go and stay somewhere else. Then cities revenues from like uh, room and alcohol, like people don't do shopping here. So do you or the uh, does a housing committee think that it will be a negative impact in the long run in terms of attracting people to stay in Montpelier and spend money and enjoy and experience mm -hmm. Montpelier uh, because they will not have um, Airbnb to stay. Uh -huh. So we have um, a very nice hotel on State Street and we also have the Inn at Montpelier. There's one also at the top of the hill in Berlin and there, there are hotels to stay in. Um, I, as a resident, I have lived in Montpelier 90% of my life. Um, I think we are such a vibrant city because um, because people care about our community, because people show up when there's a flood. Um, there's volunteers that show up to support each other. Um, we are a vibrant city because we're able to work where we can walk. Um, if we continue down this path and become more of a stow, um, it, I, I would question, you know, how vibrant of a city can we be if we don't have people that can actually afford to live here? Um, the reason I, I, I'm sure I, you all know this, I said it before, but the reason I joined the housing committee is because um, because of our, our refugee community um, was really having a hard time finding housing. Um, and these are people that lend 
an incredible vibrancy, um, both culturally and to our schools. Um, my children um, have, you know, deep friendships. I have deep friendships with um, with our new our new neighbors. Um, they can't afford to live here if they can't find an affordable place to live. Um, and the shortage of housing makes it really uh, difficult for people who are not high income to live here. And I think it's really um, behooves us all to ensure that this community is somewhere that we all can live, um, not just the most uh, privileged of us. And so I think um, there's a question of, do we wanna prioritize um, visitors or do we wanna prioritize people who live and volunteer and work here and go to school here? All about creating a balance, right? It will be great yes. if you could. Sure. Last question. Um, so um, we don't have any data. This idea is great. I really like the idea, but we don't have numbers or data yet. So how long do you think, or the housing committee thinks it will take for us to have some numbers and data say that, yeah, we should continue doing this. It will be great for our community and for our uh, city. Or um, actually, right? Let's go back and think, uh, think uh, it again, and like plan or revise the idea. Sure. So, like one year, couple years. I think you you are the um, body that the city sent here. You know, the city voters sent here to make decisions like that. Um, this ordinance suggests um, that data be submitted every um, April first. Um, you can take a year and see, you know, what data comes in, take two years and see if more data and different data comes in. I mean, um, it's right now we are, we have no data and there's no understanding of um, where we are or where, where we can improve. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about a citizen's government that um, we can um, adjust an ordinance as more information comes to us. So, um, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't have to be static. It can be, you know, uh, something that changes depending on what we know. Thank you. So in a year, we can see the results, which is great, right? In I, terms of I numbers, I mean, <laughs> I don't know because we've numbers. never we've never done this before. So, um, I mean, it's going to take, you know, you you would have to decide in a year. Do we have enough data to to make a decision? I see. Yeah. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank okay. Carrie. Thanks. Um, so it, it's true that we don't have uh, quite the the hard solid data that we would ideally like to have, but we don't we we don't have nothing. We don't have no information. We do have um, we've kind of you know done some scans of who, what's on Airbnb, what's on the the um, like if um, there's something else that's like where you have uh, rentals that are like for a month at a time, um, okay. yeah, and and then. The, the other thing that we have a sense of just from living in a small community and talking to our neighbors and looking at what's on Airbnb is that uh, it seems that the large majority of the practicing Airbnbs right now would continue to be allowed under this ordinance. So we would not be eliminating a whole bunch of Airbnbs, uh, very few. Um, it's really much more about trying to stave off a um, move towards people just, you know, buying a house and so that they can rent it out on Airbnb and not make it a place for somebody to actually live in and be part of the community. Um, I think that, you know, there's when there's there is a need for places for visitors to stay. And we do have hotels in town. And I would imagine that, you know, I mean, well, I think that it's important to have a strong hotel industry as well as places like Airbnbs. And so what happens when you, um, I mean, it, the Airbnb situation, I believe is already affecting hotels. Uh, I know that if, you know, the, the in Montpelier, I haven't talked to them, but I, but they advertise on Airbnb. And so that's, you know, that's telling you where people are, are starting to shift. And so, so this is, well, the way I see this is a way to try to kind of hold that off. Um, I don't think we're going to be like Stowe because I just think we're fundamentally different kind of community, but, um, but I do think it's important to, to do what we can to try to preserve housing for people who are actually going to live in the community rather than just visit and pass through. Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
grateful to the housing committee for all the work done on this. Um, I mean, and just contextualizing this is within, it's like, there's so many different things we need to be doing. So nobody's saying this is the solution, but it, this is like one of many things that the city can do. And it's kind of a low hanging fruit thing, as you said. So just, I don't know if that was explicitly said yet. So just to be clear, like this is part of a many faceted approach we need to be taking, just like we just made the zoning easier to build new housing. And so just to be clear on that, I mean, to me, like two things are coming to mind. One, Mike, Miller, our planning director a few minutes ago said we have a 0% vacancy rate. So in my mind, even if it's five units, that's five more units. Like it's to me, if it's pointed in the right direction that we want to go. And I'm thinking about things like the country club property where we might build 300 units. We don't want any of these going to this. We want th that to be attracting residents that are living here full time. And so even if it's just sending a signal, like we are not a community for investors to be looking at, to be trying to make money off of it. We want a vibrant community of residents. Like to me, I, I think this is great. It definitely seemed like there were some details between the legal memo that we received and some other things to make sure that we get the language right um, and appreciate the amendments you brought. But I, I think this is a good direction to go of one of many, many things we need to be doing on housing. So grateful to the committee. Um, I just want to draw your attention. Um, there was a phenomenal presentation by three our three housing, major housing groups um, to the, it was an all legislative caucus. I think around December on December 1st. And that was exactly what um one of the presenters said. You know, she gave, she was like, if you feel like, you know, zoning is the problem with housing, you'd be right. If you think, you know, short-term rentals is the problem is is a is a problem with housing, you'd be right. I mean, she had like the list of like 15. You must have seen that. Um and it's you have to look at every single piece, um, which is what you know we on the housing committee were trying to do. And it's it is like an uphill climb. And we're looking, we're trying to look at the most simple things first. And, you know, this was something that a year and a half ago when the housing committee joined together, I was like, this is an easy one. We could have this done <laughs> to them in in two months and a year and a half later, here we are. So um, this, yes, this is just one tiny little piece, but it is a tiny piece. And it's um, it's it's important to send a message that housing is full-time, long, long-term housing is important to the city. Tim. Appreciate your efforts on this, Rebecca. You have been amazing pulling it together. I, you know, unfortunately, when you get to the end of it, I'm still not convinced. But, I know. Um, and I think part of it is because um, we do have a lot to learn about the actual issue. We're trying to craft a solution to a problem we don't understand very well yet. Uh, Stanley Brinkerhoff sent out a piece that I don't know if you all get to read yet, um, but it's an interesting perspective on it. And I think he did try to quantify it. I noticed, Adrian, you weren't on the mailing list. So I can give you. I had it. Oh, you did get it? Yeah. Good. Oh, good. Okay. So, I mean, Stanley's take of studying the Airbnbs and the VRBOs and how few units actually would come down at the end, probably being in this category was interesting. Um, I, I think when I look at the ordinance, the way it's crafted or trying to be put together, it looks pretty expensive to enforce, to enact. You know, when you've got to do a rental registry and you've got enforcement actions and uh, if everybody's paying $110 a year to register a unit and you've got, if Stanley's right, 88 in Montpelier today, that's $800 a year for gross revenue to come in to uh, administer this program. Uh, it's it's going to cost the city some real money, I think, to do it. I don't think the 8800 is going to come close. Uh, and we're really not in a budget position to add new programs like this that aren't priority. Um, looking at potentially having to hire new people to administer them. It, that's my fear with it. It looks really expensive. And and if you look at Burlington as a, as a model, um, yeah, they are. But also in our attorney's opinion, they point out that Burlington's also involved in some litigation already over this, this zoning ordinance, um, which is just another thing to be aware of. So um, I, I would favor a, a slower approach to it, maybe establish a rental registry and maybe look at our total rental resource, because this is just a small piece of, of all the units we have in town. And I think we need to better understand what we have to be able to know what we need. So anyway. Yeah. See how it is first. Hmm. Can we have something like that? Well, Say yes, and have the have the program right away. 
Well, we conceivably could. I don't know how the pi a pilot for something like this would work. Um, right. One of the questions I have uh, following up on your uh, comment, Tim, is what do we think? And I'm sure that, uh, or I assume that in at the housing committee, you've had some uh, discussion about this. What do you think would be involved in administering this? You know, what, and, and, and I just don't know, like what, are we expecting to send somebody out to inspect every unit? Are we uh, just just what do we think is would be involved that would uh, that would uh, require either the hundred ten dollar annual fee or should it be a higher annual fee or 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 what what work are we are we buying with the registration? Is that a question? It's a question to anyone, but you're up here, so yeah. Um, so Montpelier does not have a have a robust enforcement mechanism now, as far as like uh, someone going into rentals, long term rentals or short term rentals now, um, and that was something that you know we talked about, and it's we're not asking you know for a new department of the city. Um, what we are asking for is to send a message that says we don't want people to buy up houses and and turn them over. Um, it can be a, um, like I said, it could be a, a volunteer uh, committee um, that looks at, you know, just everyone I'd say it was my week. I would look at um, all the um, all the posts on Airbnb and VRBO and ma match them to a registry. So that'd be a free um, service. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't cost anything. Um, and then, it would be like a parking ticket and they would city hall would send, send a letter that says, here's your, you know, you're out of compliance. Here's your bill. Just have an administrative question. Do you know the cost? So you said Burlington outsources this. Yeah. Um, I mean, but they have a much more robust. I understand it, but is it, I'm just wondering. I can't you know, remember off the top of my head. It was not cheap, which is why we, Thought about right. the volunteer so option. Is it a per uh, unit? Uh, I'm just curious. That's I can't remember. Yeah, I could. Uh, it's been. It was a long time <laughs> when I had that so conversation with Burlington. Yeah. Um, okay. Adrian. Just a, another question. Just thinking about the our kind of the customers, right? So the folks that have these Airbnbs that would be impacted by you know, paying to be put on the registry, like what was your, the committee's process of working with them to kind of bring them into this loop, to get their input, to get their feedback, to understand their perspective. I don't see their voice in here and maybe it is, I'm just missing it, but I really want to understand. I mean, that's a huge piece of the puzzle. They're, they're, this is their homes. This is, you know, they're, they're renting, you know, spaces in their homes and now they're going to be having to pay a fee for a permit. So how do they feel about it? Like, what is their perspective? So we are a city committee. We warn our agendas. Um, it's no secret that we've been talking about short-term rentals for a long time. We post our agendas. Um, we've heard from a couple of folks, but it's the Montpelier Housing Committee is not the hotbed of activity as far as public um, participation, mm -hmm. but it's not like, it's not a secret that we are talking about it. Um, so. We have public comment. We we're open to public comment in every meeting. Um, okay. So we have we have heard from a few people. What are they saying? Um, one was that they did not want. Um, they live in British Columbia, and they have a house here on Northfield Street, and um, they thought it was completely unfair that they. Would not be able to rent it out um, in the short term. Um, there was someone else who has a property. Um, he has several properties in the downtown core. Um, he has an Airbnb. He lives next door. Um, so he also didn't like that. You know, it's it's. You'll be no surprised. It's not surprising to hear that people that would not they would have to rent their house in the long term. Um, and they make a lot of money in the short term. They don't want to change their business model. So yeah, I remember three people. I remember hearing about this person in British Columbia. It seems like we hear about that person all the time. That's someone who 
you know, wants to have it for family to come visit or something like that. Is that right? And do they, uh, but so is the place occupied most of the time or not occupied most of the time? It's, I, I don't know. I don't know them. They wrote a letter to us, so I didn't, it was, we weren't able to ask questions. And it, I think they wrote a letter to the city council and they, which was forwarded to us. That sounds right. So, so that's a house that could be a family's home if they weren't doing that. Lauren. To me, it seems like the most resources will take setting up the database. I, the way the legislature is going, I mean, they've been talking about a rental registry for years. I think that's coming at some point. Barry already has one. I mean, it might be worth asking them what it costs or what it costs to set it up and then what annual costs are once you do that work. Maybe we already know that information. Isn't this? We might have someone who knows. Yeah, Barry, <laughs> Mike. Um, <laughs> like, and, and this is a much smaller data set because you're just asking for short-term rentals to start. It might give us like, I mean, I think a rental registry is coming. I think I think it's a good idea. I think we should do it for the fold and just to get a better sense. And even just like there were issues around the flood, around like notification. We don't know, you know, all the renters. And like, so I think, I think there's other good reasons to pursue a rental registry that's broader than this. And I think that would take more capacity, um, but just... Yeah, I guess I was just curious and maybe Mike could speak to Barry's experience with that because that seems like the biggest resource intensive piece of this to me. Enforcement is totally discretionary. Like we could spend a lot of money on it or we could do spot checks twice a year and and call it good, but we've sent the signal through our ordinance to people. So like to me, that's, we could spend a lot or we could spend very little on enforcement. Yeah, so Mike Miller, uh, so I, before being, uh, planner for the city of Montpelier, I was the planner for the city of Barrie for five years. So the rental inspections were under my uh, umbrella as I was there. So it's it was a complicated process. They have not only registry, but they also have inspections. So that's a, it's a much bigger, much more intensive process and was a very heavy lift and was very understaffed. And so you know, the hope was to get to everybody every couple of years, but it really is it's a much, there, there's a lot of administration that goes to it. We did have to send out annually, um, May 1st, we had to send out all of the letters to all the reg, uh, all everyone who was on the renter list to get the new payments, follow up with them. Uh, it did have, that process did have a lot, but that was every rental property. If we're talking 80 Airbnbs, that's a much smaller Cool, but it does usually require a number of different letters that go out. Um, obviously, every time you send a letter, it's another 60 cent stamp on that one. Um, so and it's small, but at the same time, after you've done a lot of these, you start seeing the costs that start getting into there, including the time and the follow-ups. And what do you do about somebody who you know is doing it and who isn't? Then you then you get into the enforcement pieces. Um, what we did learn about the enforcement piece was that, um, so this goes through um, what's called the Judicial Bureau, so the ticketing authority. Uh, I went through the whole process, and what I learned was I don't want to be doing this, and so the best way to do this is to have a police officer come and issue the ticket with you, and they then are on the responsible party for then going to court when that comes up and all those pieces. So um, it's a, it's, there are a lot of legal requirements to issuing tickets and it seems like it would be an easy process. It is not after going through it with all of the caveats. If you have to ask if they're a veteran or if they're this or they're that, because you have to follow all of these special rules. Well, that's what police officers do. So the easiest thing to do is to grab an officer. Question is how much of a burden does that come down to? Um, and it really depends if, if, you pass the rules and everybody cooperates, it's real easy. If you pass the rules and you've got to be following up with 25 Airbnbs who don't want to cooperate, then you're, you know, then we're having to issue tickets because they're not actually there. <clears throat> Unlike the rental registry where it's a little bit easier to connect with people. Sometimes the Airbnbs might be a little bit more difficult if they're in British Columbia. How do we issue them tickets? Um, that goes back to, back to a question for the police officers, but um, it's not impossible, but um, I think it's I think it's um, maybe to, to Tim's point, it's it's how we prioritize the use of the staff we have. Um, 
on the various projects. And we're going to get to, you know, the planning department and what our, what our departmental, everything we're working on is um, and how we want to divide up our time. Um, but it is, it is possible we could do it out of our office. Uh, we certainly would kind of rather move, keep our priorities where they are right now um, and see if there's other avenues. If volunteers can do it, that would be great. Um, I guess we have any other questions. Uh, Palin. So, um, we did so many cuts during the budget <clears throat> discussions and not seeing what the cost will be to city. It is a little bit like saying yes, something we don't know what will happen in the long term. So um, if we have maybe estimated number, okay, in a year, city has to use that much, that percentage of its employees, right? This, if we hire someone else, like, like a firm or something outside, this is the cost. So if we can see some um, dollars, let's say, I think it will be better for public uh, and also for me as a city councilor uh, to support this idea because I like the idea. But sometimes I feel voting for an idea is not the same voting for a systematic change. So I want this idea to turn into a real change. All the reasons you just listed, right? To make our community more vibrant, like uh, providing more houses for um, people who cannot afford so high rent, uh, rents. Um, but I don't know the cost. So it is a little bit difficult to decide this for me. Thank you. So the second part of when I presented this the first time was a tax that would that would match the Burlington um, local option tax. Um, it was largely panned <laughs> um, because it was too, you know, the process was such that it has to go to the city voters and um, so you, as a committee, sent us, said, just let's work on the first part. Um, there is a way to to build more um, financial resources in by by increasing the local option tax. Um, I, sorry, what's <laughs> over oh. my shoulder? Um, I, I mean, there, I don't believe, I mean, I think what Carrie said is really important. This is, largely to send a message that we want people to live here um, in the long term. We don't want people buying up houses and, and renting them in the short term. Um, to Lauren's point, you can decide how much enforcement you want, you want or as much or little enforcement you want to do. To Mike's point, um, you have a grand list. There is a, an address for every house that you can mail a parking, you know, mail the enforcement ticket to. Um, you know, there's there are mechanisms, I'm sure, to reach the people who own the houses that with that don't involve, you know, sending a police officer to British Columbia. Adrian, I know you mentioned this, but I just want to make sure I'm very clear. So, um, for I know we have, you know, in the nursing world, where you have a crisis in terms of you know traveling nurses and places to stay because we have no places from this day. So I know in central Vermont, they do stay in short-term rentals. I don't know if that's the right term, but um, can you just tell me a little bit more about like, you know, for visiting nurse or traveling nurses, as an example, would, would this preclude them from staying in these homes? Like, well, okay. Just wanted, I knew she, you talked about like legislators and like, I just want to make sure like in my mind, that was like a very clear example. Generally, um, nur uh, visiting nurses have, I think a I, I'm like totally months. making this up, but it's I would, six months, yeah, like a year. it's not, yeah. okay. it's not, you know, under okay. a month. Okay. Um, and if, if it is under a month, they can rent a place that is, you know, that okay. someone is in Hawaii for the month. I mean, there's still there. It's not like Airbnbs are going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, it's just saying that we need to, we need to make them a lot tighter so we can protect the housing we have that we have. Sorry, just another okay. question. I'm a process person also. So I like numbers and I love process. 
So for this, so this is an ordinance that we're thinking of either adopting or not adopting. So after the ordinance, say it's approved, then from a city perspective, there would have to be processes put in place to receive these funds. That's what we're talking about in terms of like capacity, money to support this. Um, does the city have the capacity and the funding and staffing to support adding a new ordinance to maintain, monitor, and effectively um, manage this new ordin ordinance? So to answer your process question with process, um, what would what would happen? So in this case, um, I think we we haven't been sure what direction the council wanted to take. Re Rebecca and her, and her group presented, I think in December, right before the budget. And it was like, we'll talk to you after town meeting, right? When we're, our head's a little clearer and, you know, fine. And um, so we haven't really put a lot of work into this yet. What would happen is, you know, this is a first reading. You can, so you'd have to have at least one more hearing. Minimal. You could have more. Um, you know, we could advertise it and you can ask us you know direct as part of your you could say will you provide some analysis we probably work with the committee and come up and so you could maybe set the second hearing for a month from now you know you can control the process to get the information that you want and we would do the best we could to put together a fair assessment you know i'm i, I was just recalling that we we looked at a rental registry here for a long time ago now but again, it was the same idea. It was going to be, you know, hundred dollars an apartment per month, but the or a year. But um, the guarantee was every three years we would do an inspection, and at that point, it was enough revenue to pay for the inspector. Um, but that was every single apartment, not just every single Air Airbnb. But but one of the benefits of that. So I think one of the questions I think as we think about this, because clearly one of the goals is really clear: preserve the housing and all stuff. And you know, I think back to the rental registry. I don't want to confuse things too much, but one of the one of the benefits of that wasn't just having a rental registry. It was that, that inspection would help make sure that we had safe, you know, quality or at least safe housing for people. Um, so they got there was something in it, you know, for the tenant, even though it was probably going to get added to their rent because at least once every three years, someone was making sure the electrical was fine and the plumbing was fine and the exits were proper and the fire doors and those kind of things. And so one of the questions is what, you know, we're getting to manage this. So how would we want to set this up? Is this, are we implying that by licensing this or that it is a safe place for someone to be, you know, or are we simply saying you have permission to rent this on Airbnb? So I think, you know, just, understanding what it is someone is getting with their with their registration fee um and how what we want to do with that is it you know information you know so i, I think those are the kinds of questions we'd want to think through with the housing committee to make sure we were getting the product that everybody wanted but so long-winded way of saying you know you can be clear with us how you want to proceed and we would want to ask all the right questions and you know, do it right. Basically, if we, if that's what, if you want to do it, we should do it right and make sure we're doing it for the outcome that we want. Palin. Maybe we talk about so many alternatives who will deal with this ordinance. Maybe the next step is to decide specifically which department, city department, and then maybe head that department can have this person to deal with like again like an estimated budget <laughs> well i i think i don't if think you, you need to do that i think you know if you direct that you want this done that's really my job to figure out which department and how we do that it probably would be the planning department but we would look to see where our resources were and what those things were um but you know you 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 set the goal and the policy that you want to follow and we come back to you and say, here's how we would do it and what that would look like and what we think are the pros and cons and the problems and the benefits. And maybe it's, you know, a combination of the volunteers scouring mm -hmm. the the websites and we do the follow-up work, you know, the, how do we best put this together to get the outcome that 
you want. At the end of the day, you are still setting the policy and you're setting the desired outcomes. It's our job to work with you to get them to what you want. And, you know, so if you want to do it, if you don't want to do it, whatever, that's your choice. Uh, and then you, and if you have specific, you know, obviously you could say, we might want to do this, but come back with a proposal about how it would happen and we do that. Lauren. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Um, I mean, it, it seems like you could either make this really complicated and expensive or really simple and not that expensive at all, which is the direction I would <laughs> prefer to go. Like, and so I don't want to get a proposal that's like, this is going to cost like half an FTE to run this program. Like, I think that's like, you could. So anyway, I just, I just want to be clear. Like, I like this idea. I like a really simple version, certainly to get it going to me. I mean, the one approach that we could think about, for example, could be, we put it in place. We don't plan to do enforcement for a year. We'll get data April one. We'll see what's the scope of this. Um, you know, and then we'll have a better sense. Like how many units are we really talking about? How much follow-up? We could then get a better sense of like, what would enforcement look like at that point? Like it gives us some data to work from. Um, I mean, there's going to be a, a little bit of a, if we're dissuading this, then it's like, it could have grown and we'll never know that. <laughs> so like, but then it's doing its job if it's keeping the numbers kind of low, but like the numbers that I'm seeing of like, you know, anywhere from like 18 to 88, it just seems like a very manageable thing to collect some data on. Um, I mean, the thing that might be helpful is like, okay, if we did a bare bones program that phase one is let's get, but let, let's put this concept out there. So we're starting the dissuasion soon. We maybe phase in enforcement and let's get this data though. Um, so that then we can get a better handle and better answer these questions. Um, like what, what would be like the bare minimum that it would take? Cause then it seems like we could set the fee to like based on at least like the prelim preliminary numbers that we have to be like, what would what would a reasonable fee that would hopefully cover the number of hours that we think it would set to set up, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. And, but like, I know there will be real steps that the city would have to take, like to, to do even a very simple program. So like, let's get a sense of what, what that might look like and then set a fee to meet, to match that. Jim. Keep it simpler. And that's why I think I gravitated toward if we just get some kind of registry together and have safety codes for short-term rentals, which must exist anyway, but publish them and put them out. I think that's a great start. I think this ordinance is pretty heavy handed and to really enforce it as it's written would be expensive if we really took it to the words that are here. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that when I first got into the council almost a year ago and on the housing committee. And one of the first topics, Rebecca was talking about this and Donna and I went to Montreal and, and there was a big fire that weekend. And there was a beautiful building in old town that burned and the top floor was an Airbnb and the city had no records, no way to trace who owned it or who was staying there. I mean, there are really some safety reasons for knowing who owns properties, how they're being used yeah. and, and who to contact when something goes wrong. Um, so, I mean, I think there's value in that registry. Um, and I think that's the first step, but I think that can be done more cost effectively than the other parts of this piece. I feel we may be at the point where someone could make a motion uh, for what to do. You know, we're, we have a whole range of options, including move to have another, uh, another reading and a public hearing on, on this as it's, uh, proposed along with some instructions to the administration for the, the thing, kind of things we've been talking about to anything else. Oh, and I'm sorry, I should say that I would like to get comments from the public. And so I see someone here. Thank you for raising your hand. Why don't you step on up? Hi, I'm Elko. I'm District 2. I live in the College Street area. My husband, Frank Saliani is here. Um, and I wrote a letter to city council a couple months ago, so you may already know this story, but I'm going to present it anyway. Um, first, I wanna thank the housing committee for your work on this issue and also city council, because I know it's a complicated issue with a lot of parts. Um, so I just wanna present the perspective of an Airbnb owner who is not in British Columbia, but who actually is, is a member of the community. Um, we, uh, we live on Foster Street, in Montpelier, um, we own Greenhouse Pottery, which is on Berry Street. So if you remember um, the old building, it was um, the Berry Street Market. 
So we bought this building three years ago with the express purpose of putting Frank's studio in the downstairs and then holding an Airbnb upstairs so we can have tourists come in and purchase Frank's work. There's only so many pots you can sell to your neighbors and friends um, in a small community like Montpelier. So that was our business model. Um, if you remember what greenhouse, uh, the Berry Street Market looked like, um, it had been shuttered for years. It was vacant. It was an unfortunate, a terrible situation. It was very sad. Um, no fault of the of the owners, but um, it was never intended for us to be a residential property. It was intended to be a commercial property. Um, the investment that we um, it's been a significant time in, uh, you know, financial investment to get it running, but it opened, it's finally open. So please come by <laughs> um, if the, if the flag is out. So um, I wanted to tell you a bit about us and our guests, um, our guests um, are visitors to Montpelier, but when they visit, um, they have done, spent weeks here volunteering for flood relief efforts. A lot of them send their children to the PAGE program at the State House. Um, many, many of them are parents of Norwich students. So yes, there are visitors and tourists coming through, but they all buy pots and they all spend money in Montpelier. So um, it's essential to our business model to have these people here and come and buy Frank's pots. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, other towns that have addressed this issue, um, I believe, are uh, um, you talked about other towns. Morrisville, I believe, has a grandfathering mm -hmm. policy. So if we want to send a message or send a signal, I think one option to do that would be to do it prospectively um, to prevent. I also don't want people from other states or other countries buying properties and keeping them away from the residents of Montpelier. But I'm, I happen to be one of those residents, too. So you could signal something prospectively and then grandfather people in as they have in Morrisville. Um, what else? I think that's it. I just want to express that we are also people who live here and work here and are a part of the community and want to invest in the community. And Airbnbs are not always the the um the bane of a town. Sometimes it can provide business um, an opportunity for people. When you bought that uh, building, did you do a lot of work to the uh, apartments upstairs? We did work to the apartments upstairs because because yeah. I've I've been in that building. I was um, years ago uh, talking to uh, to the tenants there because they had some major concerns with uh, yeah. with conditions. Yeah, they were the owners. They were the owners, and so um, yeah, they had concerns with the conditions of the apartment. Um, they lived above the store and they operated it. And then, with the the woman's husband died, I, I think they were just unable to maintain it. Um, you know, that place was robbed at gunpoint numerous times. So um, we really feel that we're part of a burgeoning Berry Street rena like Renaissance. You know, you can see a lot going on in Berry Street. We really want to be a part of that. Um, and Airbnb is the way that we make that work for our business. Um, so yes, it's it's safe now. We went through the city was very very supportive of us um, going through the development review process. So um, yes, the the apartment's safe. It has smoke detectors, it has carbon monoxide detectors, it has um, uh, fire extinguishers. So yes, it's it's um, it's safe. Um, those conditions are no longer an issue. Well, I might be thinking of a, of the building next door because there are multiple apartments upstairs and. They yes. were they were dissatisfied with the landlord because of the yes, and I will tell you we worked very yeah we worked very close with Down Street who was on one side of us and then the apartments which is above the um the new restaurant and the hair cutting salon the people that they they frequently come and talk to Frank in the studio there are neighbors now too we live really just up the hill um, when we moved in I think I put this in my letter there was a rat problem. Um, in the area. So there was an open compost box and the place was infested with rats. Frank personally caught 25 rats on his own. Um, and we worked with Down Street to rectify that problem. So neighbors still stop Frank on the street and thank him for cleaning the area. up. So um, yeah, it's it's better now. Okay. Uh, and we did get legal advice that uh, if we were to do something like this, uh, we would be required by law to allow pre-existing uses to continue. Is that excellent? I'm a lawyer myself. That's excellent because because it feels, um, yes, yes. Uh, sending a signal and what feels a bit more like a taking. I think that's a, that's a distinction. So I, I wasn't aware of that legal advice. That's great advice. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lawyers agreed. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we do. Ms. Stan. if I can figure out how Zoom works. Um, I my my email was cited and I just wanted to 
clarify, I think what was at the bottom of that email uh, was, was just an option, um, a suggestion that um, we could potentially even go a, a step further in this and use existing mechanisms like zoning. Um, the council could consider that uh, this be a, a zoning request that, you know, whatever kind of Airbnb it, you know, covered or uncovered, a room in a, in a building or otherwise, um, you know, those impact the community, those impact neighbors, and you know, going through an existing process that has fees associated with it, that has safety checks associated with it, um, could provide, you know, at the council's option, or even kind of going further than this. So I didn't, the, the way the email was referenced, I think, uh, was kind of not supportive of it, um, when in fact, I, I think I was trying to make the point that we have existing systems um, that could make this even more powerful and send a signal much, much earlier. Uh, and I, you know, there's a couple of communities cited in there that have done that. So I just want to clarify my, my intent there. Thank you. Thanks. And I confess, I know your email came in sometime this afternoon. I have not had a chance to read it yet, but I certainly will. Thanks, Jack. Anyone else from inside the room or online who'd like to be heard on this? Okay, Lauren. Would make a motion that we schedule a second reading April 17th and request that staff attempt to assess what city obligations and estimated costs might be to implement it. And do you think April 17th gives the city enough time or would it be better to do it a month out? I don't know what you, do you have a thought about that? It, does May, it would probably, May 8 would probably be a little more, more easier. May 8th. Let's, let's do May 8th. Yeah, that will be the second, two, make sure second we get Wednesday. Good data. I mean, I'm not trying to delay it, but I just that the second one or was that, that would, this is the first one, this would, but there was some there hearings come out. Right. Oh. <laughs> you want to open a public? Well, I first I think I think it's gonna what? it'll we'll have an have we'll probably have more than after okay. tonight, I would I'm guessing. So so four seventeen or five eight. I, May eighth work better for you? Okay for you, Lauren. I just want to make sure we have good information. So if that's when we're going to get better information, then I guess we might as well do that. Is is there a second? I just want to make sure we get an updated copy of this too, because you were there were strikes in here that you had. So I want to make sure that we have an updated copy and if there's a way to include the grandfather. Well, that's one of the things we can do is okay. get it more in ordinance form. Okay, and perfect. Make the sure second we run hearing. past the lawyer if there are all those kind of mm -hmm. things. So even if in addition to the implementation work, we can also have it ready for okay. adoption. That's so good. Thank you. If that's if you all want to go forward with it, then we'll put more time and effort into it. Not if we don't, it's your policy. All right. Is there any other discussion on the motion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 You're opposing? You're, you're a no? Okay. Uh, roll call. Uh, Hurl. Cone. Aye. Heaney. No. Brown. Aye. Gill. Aye. All right. There we are. Um. And it is 8.23. We're coming in on our normal time for our 8.30 break. So I'm going to say let's break now and, uh, and come back at uh, 8.33. And so I think we are up to planning and development overview. All right. So good evening again. So... This uh, this is the second. Uh, I didn't get to see Kurtz last week, but um, the various planning departments are coming, or the de various departments each are coming in uh, over the next couple of months to kind of give you an overview and understanding of who we are, what we do, um, so that way you're have a little better idea of um, 
the various departments and the roles we play and what are our core services. Um, so I'm here, um, not only it's planning and community development, but it's also uh, building and code enforcement. I'm actually the director of both departments. And let me see if I can, there we go. All right, so this is the whole department. There are uh, only five of us. And uh, so that's Josh, Michelle, Audra, me, and Meredith. And Audra in the middle it has officially nine days left. So she is on her way out, uh, going to enjoy her retirement. Um, so uh, most of us have uh, been here for varying amounts. Audra, uh, 17 years, I've been here 10 and everybody else is um, in the on the newer side. Um, the department kind of breaks up in this way. Uh, I'm the director. Uh, Meredith Crandall is our zoning administrator. She is a 0.8 FTE, so she is here Monday through Thursday. Does not work on Friday. Josh is the community and economic development specialist, and we have Audra, who's planning and zoning assistant, and we are currently searching for uh, our new planning and zoning assistant to replace Audra. We're doing interviews right now. I also share responsibilities with the fire chief, Bob Gowans. Uh, we both are the directors and oversee the building inspector, who is Michelle Savory. And as of today, we're looking for a new one of them too. Fire chief. Oh, thank you. Don't scare me. <laughs> Not, like, building not building inspector. <laughs> not building inspector, thankfully. Oh. Um, so core services, what do we do in planning and community development? Um, I usually try to describe this in uh, in this way. I break it down. There are a couple of ways we can look at it. Uh, we are responsible for planning the big picture pieces, developing city plans, updating zoning, uh, doing various studies resiliency planning, um, projects like Confluence Park, the planning for that. Um, so we do planning, which is what do we want to see happen? And then we have these four other ways of implementing plans. So these are how we do those things we plan for. So this department looks at what do we want to do? Think of Country Club Road. And then once we've decided what we want to do, we are usually a part of those implementing pieces. And some of that implementing plans and goals the community has, some of that can come through permits, zoning, river hazard, building codes, vacant building ordinances. Uh, we were just talking about the um, rental uh, or the short-term rental ordinance that would be using a regulatory approach to achieve a community goal. We have programs. So we can go through and do things that, these are things that happen over and over. They're not things that happen one time. They're things that we do um, on a regular basis. That could be the community rating system, which is from FEMA, E911 road numbering, uh, VCDP grants, that's the uh, community development. You think of those as HUD grants. Uh, we do those, uh, Josh handles those. Those are usually pass-through funds that, so we're working with housing partners. Uh, the Housing Trust Fund is a program. The Designated Downtown is a program. Growth Center and TIF, those are all programs. So the, the other two ways we can work on accomplishing our goals are through projects, which are things we do one time. Um, we're going to do one transit center. We're going to do one country club road. Um, we're not going to be continuing to do those. Uh, they could be projects that are as specific as uh, we've got to currently have a project that we're working on right now in response to the flood to elevate Dog River Road. That's to help protect the sewer plant from a future flooding event. Uh, it, uh, every time it floods, it gets right up to the top of the road. Um, and our plan is to elevate that road to make sure that it doesn't go ever over the top of that road. And so that's a project. We would do that once. Uh, 1216 Main Street will be on the agenda for later on today. That's another project. The fourth way communities, you, can implement your goals is through policies. And the way we've kind of crafted policies and thought of policies is how we spend our money, how we use our resources. So uh, tax stabilizations, development agreements, which again, we'll be talking about development agreements later on tonight. Uh, net zero, which is how we spend our money on our city resources, 
uh, our city buildings. So these are kind of the ways when somebody says um, this is a problem or this is a goal that we have, uh, our department usually tries to eventually break it into these different pods. What is the most effective way of our of accomplishing these goals? And the permits are generally through the folks you'd expect, uh, Meredith, Audra, and Michelle. And these programs and projects and policies are things that are usually handled through Josh or myself. So what do we what do we cost? So I believe the the just short of seven million dollars is the the total budget for the city. And planning accounts for about $491,000 of that. Um, and specifically for ours, we, uh, for our department, most of our costs, almost 90% of our costs are for personnel. We have a small amount that are uh, operating costs and some other costs that are in there. For the most part, we are just people. Um, that comes out to about $62 per capita. And I think I've seen numbers on a on a average house that are usually about a hundred hundred dollars a year. For the building inspector, this is um, currently it costs about one hundred and twelve thousand to uh, dollars to to run that department. Uh, typically, in the past, our fees fully covered this and sometimes made a little bit of money. Um, so usually we would always talk about the building inspector doesn't really cost you any money because uh, it pays for itself. Lately, the revenues had been down. We had a conversation about this in, uh, I believe, in, in February. So we're going to see how revenues turn around for next year. Hopefully things turn back around. Um, but right now it costs about $14 a year for that program, which is uh, per capita. So, um, so the opportunities and challenges for, for planning, uh, the, one of the big ones, uh, flood recovery, that's taking a lot of our time. And not only was it a lot of our time, we were located in the basement of city hall and we had four feet of water in our office. So that required all of our files to be, uh, most of our files were flooded. We had to send them off to be dried, uh, at a facility in Massachusetts, we've got them back but they're now just sitting in boxes up at Country Club Road. We're gonna to need to eventually digitize and scan those files and put them in so we can actually do title searches and do our work. Uh, right now, they're not in any organized box. They're just piled in 60 or 70 boxes. Uh, eventually, we're gonna to need to get relocated back in City Hall. So uh, big challenge is we have five people sitting in an office about a quarter the size of this room. It's a pretty small space to have five people working in. Um, so that is certainly a big challenge, not having our resources, not having our files, not having our maps. Um, that's it's it's a challenge to kind of get used to not having everything that we used to have right within arm's reach. Uh, our second challenge and opportunity uh, I'd point out is the city plan. So this is something we've talked about for a long time. Um, we readopted the old plan, which is sometimes referred to as the city master plan. Back in 2017, uh, we, we adopted it with just minor amendments um, with an intention of going through and doing a full update. And we've got the full update ready to go. Uh, and I'm happy to say that the first hearing, and we're getting, getting ready to get the locations and all the information put out, but it will be May 13th, will be the first public meeting on the first three chapters of the plan. And we will have more information coming out on the specifics of that and where you can get more of the details and copies coming up in the next two two or three weeks. Like are those uh, planning commission uh, hearings? Uh, these are going to be public input sessions. We haven't warned it as a hearing yet because we really want to start, go through. Um, the planning commission voted to, there are 11 chapters. Their decision was to do um, every month to do one block of three. So they'll do three, 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 and then the, the last two. So it will probably be in September. They'll be done with public input. They'll then combine and hear what everybody says and then go back to hearings, um, which we hope if we've got had a positive um, input process, we hope that the hearings will be um, you know, more for trying to get things polished up and getting those last last items that are um, that need need work. 
we can work on those through the through that process. Thanks. So it's we're we're happy to say we are finally at the point we're having our hearings. We are done with floods. We are done with COVID. We are done with <laughs> everything that has been thrown in the way. But we are finally ready. Uh, the third challenge um, is uh, well completing uh, completing CCR. So plan, prepare, implement. We've ta I've talked about that. We are currently working our way through those preparation steps, and we're going to. That's going to take time. It's going to take some effort. Um, so that is a third of our challenges, or I would look at this as an opportunity. The fourth piece uh, of ours, I would say, is the steady operating costs. Uh, while budgets have gone up, um, our budgets have gone up less than inflation over time. Uh, so we're I'm proud to be able to go and say that we've been able to manage that over time. Uh, it does go up because of inflation, but we are going up less than inflation. So we try to keep that um, those costs in line. And uh, the fifth, fifth challenge is going to be welcoming a new planning assistant. Uh, Audra has been the jack of all trades, and we've relied on her for a lot over 17 years to use her skills to kind of make up for when people are out. So bringing a new person online uh, is going to take a lot of training. Uh, we're used to leaning on Audra, and now we're all going to have to kind of come together to get somebody new up to speed and uh, getting to be the next the next new Audra. Big shoes to fill. So we're going to get into uh, a little bit of the, the strategic plan coming up after this, but um, you know, the housing and resiliency uh, is uh, those are some of the bigger str strategic plan elements that come down and fall into my office. Um, but the planning, the policies, the permits, the programs, again, those same ideas. Uh, you lay the foundation by understanding what it is we want to do. Um, and many times I've worked with communities and told them that's actually the hardest part is figuring out what you want to do. Most of the time, implementing plans are actually the easier part. They're just hard work. The, but from a community standpoint, having the community come together and decide what it is very specifically they want to do. Um, that's the hard part of the community. The hard part of implementing falls on my department. And lastly, that's it. And see if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Mike. I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> Council members, any questions or comments at this point? I have an overall question, which um, is is relevant not only to the, uh, this presentation, but also to the uh, priority setting process, which is where where are you in terms of your capacity to do all the things you're doing? Uh, I would say pretty safely, I could pretty say that Josh is about in over his head on, he, he hand, he's handling all of the grants that are coming in from that, from FEMA, the working with the various property owners, uh, studying up on the new grants available. He's also does uh, economic development. So he's also been trying as much as he can to kind of stay involved in that that side of things, which we do have a lot of economic development needs. This flood has had serious impacts, not only in residential, but on commercial. And so getting involved in making those, uh, helping those, that side get back on their feet, um, it's going to be difficult as well. So I know he's very busy. Um, obviously, a lot of my work has been tied up in the city plan. It's a very heavy lift kind of finish getting getting that over the finish line obviously getting the zoning in the river hazard regulations done is a big piece um that's a big help so we don't have a lot of bandwidth um certainly not with losing audra everybody's going to have to be picking up that side to help uh and we won't have a replacement till july 1st so we've got a couple of months where we're going to be operating until the new fiscal year comes in um so we're doing okay. We're going to be fine. Um, but it is, 
certainly for the short term, it's going to be busy. And certainly folks like Josh are are very busy um, with the flood response. And with the uh, digitizing of the records, I know we sent it out to some kind of commercial uh, facility to uh, to freeze dry the records and uh, and send them back to us. And I assume you've looked at some of them to ascertain that they are, in fact, uh, readable. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, for the for the most part, uh, things are readable. There are certain things that are that are lost. Uh, certain inks don't like getting wet, so you might have an entire form that looks perfectly fine, but no signature on it because the signature was in a certain type of pen that the ink ran on. So uh, inkjet printers really don't don't like water, so we might have some plans that are blank. With um... Are, are, is there a company that would be able to uh, do the digitization process also? We haven't done a lot of homework on on what the costs would be. Um, it isn't in our current budget situation. Our priorities were to focus the money in other places. And the files can stay there until we reach a point where we we can come up with a plan for what to do with them, whether it's something that becomes uh, a winter job for the new person. Um, you know, we we go we ebb and flow through the year with our workloads. Um, Audra and Meredith will be particularly busy in the spring as developers are coming in, getting permits ready for the building season. Uh, things will slow down in the fall uh, and be a little bit quieter. November, December, January. So usually that's when we're working on some of these other projects. Um, that's why the community rating system, the CRS updates, we have them worked out. So we submit those in February because that's when it's slow for us. And stuff with these files, is it, are the boxes organized so that you can say, well, out of these 60 boxes, 40 of these are files that are 10 years old or more so we don't need to jump on them right away or anything like that they were organized all by address so and then they were just grabbed and dropped in boxes so they're not even organized right but they are in files okay. <laughs> they are in so we would just have to re kind of reorganize them and put them back in and scan them and so it, it would be a huge process but it would be a process that we'll have to we'll have to identify and see how long it takes. That was one of the things we were hoping to do um, was just to be able to go through a box or two and kind of get an estimate. It would take, you know, we did one box and it took us how long? Three weeks, four weeks, one week. And then we can at least go through, count up the number of boxes and we'd have a back of the envelope that would say it would take us this long to do the whole thing mm -hmm. in-house. Yep. Um, and then that you'll go from there to figure out what the best way to manage that is. Yeah, because the hard part is we've got to put it into our permit database. And that's where we don't know if we could get an outside firm to go and do it because they'd have to be familiar with our very specific permit software uh, to know where to insert. Just having them scanned means we don't have the boxes anymore. We just have a database with thousands of scanned files that aren't attached yet to our database. Mm -hmm. uh, Lauren. I was just thinking like the physical scanning, like we've got a bunch of high school students, like a great intern project. Like it does not feel like staff time should be spent on that. I hope like, but then somebody who has some kind of eye to expertise, it sounds like has to like file them once they're digital, but like, there seems like there could be some cheap ways we could get some help to physically scan. I would hope so many committees, every, every committee has to take a box. <laughs> 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 oh, God. anybody else with questions about this or do you want to charge right into our uh housing priority item all right shuffle Thanks, over because i think Thank you. 
PowerPoint. Now is this new button up here? Duplicate. Okay. Yep. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right. So, hello everyone. I'm going to get it teed up, but Mike's probably going to take on the lion's share of the specifics when it comes to the items with housing. Um, and this presentation will look very similar as we go through each of the goals. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Much better. Um, so I'm going to cruise through this a little bit, um, hopefully not too quickly, um, but uh, just to kind of, you know, get our bearings and then we'll start the conversation. So this particular goal is um, the one, the second one that we prioritized and it's to create more housing. Um, let's see. Looks like. Oh, there we go. Got it. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, so just a quick agenda of, you know, what we're going to be looking at. It's We'll take a look at the adopted plan um, and the status, you know, where we're at with that. Um, and then we're going to review the initiatives associated with um, what was previously adopted back in December. Um, and you'll note that some of those initiatives have changed um, just based on staff review. Um, we'll get into the details. We'll talk about what's next. And then like we did last time um, for the infrastructure goal, we'll go over council policy decisions and action items. Um, we will be pulling this all together in the end um, for a complete view of um, the strategic plan for you to take a look at. So just like last time, just to kind of orient where we are, we're kind of here in the middle where we're looking at priorities and action items and you know how we're gonna land the plane. I won't go into too much detail there. And then this is the plan that we adopted. We're looking at the create more housing goal. And so really what we're looking at is how we can create more opportunity for people of all income levels um, to make sure that housing is safe and healthy, accessible, efficient, um, and then also to make sure that um, there are critical community service resources available. And so looking at what was adopted back in December, um, here is the whole list of them, but we're looking at create more housing. And so the specific priorities or strategies that we've got going here for housing are to develop policy to reflect housing priorities, actively partner in housing projects, support private housing development. Um, there has been a slight shift in the language on the first strategy. And so I just want to note that um, and the workup that you've got in front of you. Um, the other thing to mention is in front of you, you, you have um, a summary of um, this item, um, housing, and then uh, you get um, a little bit more detail in terms of the goal, which is also posted online. And so getting into the specifics of, you know, what we're looking to get feedback on, um, I'm just going to go through each of the strategies and then the initiatives. Um, so this is the first initiative. Um, and so this is a slight difference in the language, but to enact policies to promote um, housing is the strategy that was approved, more or less, a little different there. And then um, the initiatives to support um, this particular strategy or to simplify zoning, which we had a discussion on that earlier. Um, consider housing committee recommendations, so revise housing trust fund guidelines and look at the short-term rental ordinance. So those things are underway. Um, and then also the, the next initiative to consider the city plan, which Mike just mentioned in his overview, is going to be coming. If I could just interrupt here quickly, um, just for the council's perspective. So to the extent that you want to have a conversation about what you'd like to do this year with regard to zoning, this would be the the area to do it. So when after the presentation. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving right along here. Um, so we're moving on to the next strategy. So actively partner with housing projects. And so this first one is to advance CCR housing project. The next is to create or apply for a TIF uh, program. Um, then followed by um, establishing funding um, through the housing trust fund and then advancing housing projects on city owned property. 
Um, you will note that, you know, on sort of the, the goal itself, uh, there are some of the initiatives that have tasks associated, and there are some that are pretty straightforward, and the initiative is the task. And so moving on into the third strategy uh, to support private development proposals. So this one, um, the first initiative would be to work proactively with developers, reach out to property owners of underutilized properties, um, enact local development agreement policy, which is coming up along with the tax stabilization policy, and then the creation of uh, ADU guidelines. And so what's next, um, much like with the other goals, we're really going to be looking to um, establish performance measures and to tie um, those measures to performance standards. Um, and then our goal is to be able to report out on the progress of this uh, iteration of the strategic plan by the end of the fiscal year. Um, and then next, we'll talk about the council policy decision items um, that will kind of lead the next steps in this conversation. And so it's kind of a lot to look at here, um, but we've got the first, uh, and Mike will start to chime in, I think, um, once we get, and I'll leave the slide up um, so we can talk about it. But um, the first is to simplify zoning um, and enact amendments to the zoning regulations. The second is to review and revise the housing trust fund guidelines, um, review the new short-term ordinance rental ordinance um, to consider, consider the city plan program recommendations, consider advancing CCR housing project initiatives, um, apply for a new TIF, review funding. So consider, you know, where the housing trust funds at um, and where it needs to be to, you know, support some of the programs that we want to do. And then look at advancing housing projects on city owned land and then and we've got sort of that also on tap to be discussed as we move along and then um, review local development agreements and then to review the tax stabilization policy. So there's a lot here to consider. Um, and I think at that, I might open it up just a little bit or see if Mike has anything that he wants to note in terms of any of these items, but I think they're kind of straight ahead. I can kind of continue through the rest of the presentation, but it's essentially the same, just highlighting where we're at in the review. All right. Thanks. Um, one quick question. So when we're talking about policies to promote housing, the two that were named were um, looking at the housing trust fund and short-term rentals. Just curious if, like for this year, is that all we anticipate? Is the housing committee planning to bring forward any other policy ideas that we know of at this point? Or like, is this, is the short-term rental one like the thing that is kind of ready for action this year as we just try to look at priorities? Or is your office promoting any other policies? Yeah, it's a, I know they're working on the housing trust fund guidelines as well, which will, we've, we have a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank that we really haven't been moving. And I know I've Josh is staff on the committee and I know Tim's on the committee as well, but I know one of the things they've wanted to do is to redirect how we spend those money to better use them in creating new housing. So they do have some draft guidelines they're gonna be getting out. So I do know that is a piece that will be coming out this summer and probably. The other piece is the county broken subcommittees for the first time. And, and there's a subcommittee for infill so there'll be, I think, recommendations for if we can find any ways to help move that along. Um, there's also just some commercial, a committee looking at commercial sites downtown to say places we potentially could create housing. And so there are a couple of subcommittees working on projects that'll be, um, I think, productive. So what you anticipate is that as those become ready within the housing committee, that they'll you'll come to us, put, put something on the agenda and take that up. Yes. And do you anticipate a large amount of work from Mike's department to make that happen, or you, you expect essentially to come to the council? Well, we have with Josh. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he guides us in our process. Or uh -huh. when we come okay. through. I think he's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if this is the right time, but I think, you know, you have all these policies, the decision items that you're working towards, but what I feel is missing is what 
I mean, there's the overarching goal that is, you know, Montpelier has sufficient housing opportunities for all people of all income levels, but what is it that you're working towards? Like, I feel like we're missing the numerical number in here that says over the next 12 months, we want to build 500 mixed use developments, 30 commercial properties that bring in 2000 residents and you know, we attract 10 different developers. I don't know. I just totally made that up. <laughs> I don't even know what that, but I feel like that is missing because how do you measure your progress if you don't have your baseline and your targets? And maybe it is somewhere else I've looked, but, um, you know, you have your policies, but what are these policies going to impact? And how do you know that these policies are successful in helping you achieve your goal? So that's what I would like to see. Yeah, and I think some of that's going to come in with the with the measures that that Kelly wants to get at, but we don't have the specific numbers in there. The the hard part for something like housing for my department is um, unlike ambulance calls and police calls. There's a certain amount of stuff that they do. Um, we as a part of the department have a goal of increasing housing, but we're not allowed to pick up any hammers and we're not allowed to develop any property. So we're kind of, we have to do everything we can to encourage other people to, to make that step. So it's really hard to say we're going to get X number of housing units built. Um, if we were say, um, you know, Chittenden County, if you were in Burlington, they have um, an entire organization who's dedicated to building housing. And so they can go out and actually get grants to build housing and they build housing. Um, we don't, we don't have that ability. We're not, um, we're not structured that way. So uh, we usually think a little bit longer term. That's why we talk about um, 500 or, you know, 240 units in five years or eight years. Um, you know, these longer term, because we know we're going to have to craft and build relationships with certain landowners to try to encourage them to develop. And we've got to um, do a number of pieces. So we can't look on, we want 50 units a year um, because it'll probably be 30, 20, and then maybe if everything goes well, 100, 150, and then maybe back down to 30 because we're going to have years where big projects will get developed. Um but over the long term, that's why we try to have this kind of this medium term goal of a certain number of housing units. And that's been going on since before my time. Um, they've been we've had goals when Gwen was here for 500 units and a thousand units have been kicked around from time to time. I, and I, I do think it's reasonable for the council to set a goal. Um, you know, I think the question is, we would want to be clear um, to ourselves, not to give us excuses or anything, but what which parts of that we control and which parts we don't. So like we said, we can change all the zoning in the world. We can do all these things if the economics aren't such that people can build housing. So, so but, but you know, for example, we have our, pro, you know, the projects we might be able to control. So we can say, all right, our goal is to create this many units in the next three years on the city-owned properties and then try to, you know, we'd like to encourage up to, because to your point, let's say we got a thousand new housing units. At that point, we might say, okay, maybe we want to not have such a permissive housing policy, right? Now we, there might be too many here. It's, you know, so I think setting this is where we think is the healthy place to go to is still something we could be looking to. So that is something we would look to you all and, you know, probably the master plan and those kind of things to set those goals. Um, for us, you know, it would be more, you know, have, this list here is really going to is what drives what's going to show up on your agendas over the next year. You know, these are the things you can expect to see this is or not, if you don't want to do them, but you know, these are, these are things that will show up. And then once they've either been approved or denied or dis a decision made, then that part of it's accomplished, but you're right. The big picture, what are we trying to get at at the end is important. So, I mean, I think what we're really looking for um, is, does this look, list look good generally? Kind of, you know, like last week, you know, it, does it seem like this is a, 
know, these are things that we, you know, want to work on and work towards, um, you know, or not, or if there are things that like, you'd like to add to the list or take off, um, you know, I think we, you know, are really, um, while we're doing this work, we're also still recovering quite a bit, um, as Mike had mentioned earlier, and there are some, some transitions, but, you know, I think this is certainly a list that will keep um, the planning department busy for quite a while. One thought that I have is that uh, looking at that first bullet, simplify zoning, and in the in the handout you gave us, you say simplify zoning, streamline the process, active reduction in barrier barriers, and previously in our discussion earlier tonight, the terms rate were raised about should we have a zoning ordinance that's more flexible and and these are all descriptions that I'm not sure I understand what they mean. You know, we hear talk about, well, is the zoning ordinance too many pages or is it too simple or too complicated? And, uh, or is the question, should the question really be, what do we hope to accomplish by the zoning ordinance? And I wonder if you have some thoughts about that. I mean, it's kind of a nebulous Before question. I put Mike on the spot, I mean, you know, those, those were what came out of the December yeah. session. So they were actually things that the council had identified. So, um, so I don't know. If... No, I'm not, I'm not asking Mike to, to take ownership of any of this. I'm just you know, trying to talk about, well, what does it mean when we talk about what we want to do with our zoning? So, I mean, I think each one of those words would kind of have a different um, context. I mean, simplify could be just, you know, uh, maybe removing extraneous requirements that um, maybe aren't necessary or have little impact towards our, our goals that we have. The, the streamlining, I think, is uh, would go more to making sure we have an efficient process. I think we currently have a very streamlined process. We issue permits very, very quickly. That's one of the things I'm, I'm proud of that our department has done a very good job at. Um, uh, the fact that we're, like, like I said, literally 10 times faster than when I got here. Um, and I think some of the other pieces, um, so uh, there was a third, third one you'd used, which was, Active reduction of barriers. Oh, the, the barriers. And so, yeah, that is that is a continuing process that we're always looking at um, because we can we can have discussions about um, the you know, the parking requirements. Is parking a barrier? And it it's – but it's an area where, again, we can have a discussion, and we've had a discussion because some – some in some places like Berry Street, it's, it's important – you know, that on-street parking is an important consideration. Um, and having more, having less parking requirements may mean putting a greater parking demand onto an already parking-filled street. Um, and I think with the flexibility one, uh, it's good. I, and I think we've done a good job. I think there are places we can still do better with the flexibility. We've been trying to build that into every one of our updates to make sure that um, the flexibility, how we kind of make flexibility work with um, the streamlined permitting process is we've tried to have a set of rules where if you're basically doing what we all consider what we all want, you know, if you're if you're having at least one parking space for every dwelling unit and you're meeting all the setbacks and you're meeting all the height requirements, you can come in and get your permit. If you want a waiver for your height or a waiver for your setback or a waiver for your parking, then you're going to have to go in for a hearing. So we have flexibility built into the process. We allow those things to, to go, and it just takes an extra step, and it's going to take more time. And I think that's a good balance. We can't have flexibility. The zoning administrator can't have flexibility. It's not allowed uh, under state law. They have to literally enforce the zoning. So... Um, and it has to be consistent over time. So that's why usually the rules are very clear about what's going to be an administrative approval. Then we have the flexibility that is there. Um, but 
uh, we would always admit this the, the the product that was adopted in 2018 was a product that needed a, a lot of work. And we've over the past five years, six years, we've made a lot of amendments to landscaping and signs and all these pieces. So we have that flexibility built in, but there's still a number of places where we could make more improvements to have more flexibility. And again, if the housing committee or the energy committee or any committee is working on things where they want to talk to us, we can talk about the rules and maybe find more room where we can either streamline those pro those permits or make more flexibility by putting in um, waiver rules that say, if you're doing this, we can issue the permit. If you'd like to do this, we can make that allowed as well. But you're going to have to go to a hearing and you're going to have to describe these three requirements as to why this is not going to have a negative impact on the community because you are going to be eight feet taller than your neighboring buildings. Thanks. Kelly, you look like you're about to add something. Nope. Okay. Uh, Lauren. Thanks. Um, I, I don't know if this is the right time or place, but I mean, I like the idea of council setting something like 500 units in five years that we're working to, you know, maybe some of those are under development or under contract or whatever, but like, I like us having some kind of goal that we're working towards that's tangible and measurable. And I guess my question to this slide is, does it feel like this is doing all the things that we would need to be doing to get to whatever that right number is to be aiming towards, which, I mean, a lot of it does seem like knowing that, especially like the thing that we can most control, the country club project, which has the, seems like the biggest possible number of units coming online. Um, but there's a lot of work there. And then I guess just thinking of, you know, between Isabel Circle and Heaton Woods and the Habitat Project, like what else are there ways that we can be like more clear on what are we doing to ensure that we're really supporting those in every way that we can be to be moving forward? So is, is there anything more tangible than just support <laughs> development projects that are underway, which I know you do a lot. And so maybe some of it is just naming the kinds of things that you do to just to be more clear to people of how we do do that because I know when you describe it, it's always impressive to me, like how much kind of ways the city does try to do that. <laughs> but I think that's where you get into things like development agreements and tax stabilization and those kinds of things that we can do. TIF to some extent, although that's a specific district, so that would only be within those geographic boundaries. But we don't have, you know, the state doesn't provide a lot of tools for local governments to, so the, those are the ones we have, and I think. We've dabbled in them, but I think one of the one of the key policy challenges for the city and council this year is: Are we going to go into these and you know and have discussions? Mike's going to describe development agreements tonight. You know, they're great and they have some risk and they have some. You know, we have to invest some funds up front, and so you know, do we have the wherewithal and the and the, the sort of constitution to go ahead and do that? Um, so, so there's, I think that's what a lot of this policy is about is how can we put even more sort of meat on the bone for moving these things forward? I mean, you're right. Obviously the, the projects we control, we control, but it's, it's the others that we want to be able to help. And I think the past over the, you know, the first eight years, um, I was here a lot of the, the emphasis was really on focusing on working with our nonprofit partners um, with French Block and with the Transit Center. Uh, we had a lot of effort on on working with those. And you know, we can't continue to rely on our nonprofit partners to be our our housing developers. That's why um, we we weren't the ones who initiated the Country Club Road purchase, but when we heard that was coming, we were really excited about the opportunity that we would be able to facilitate housing happening at that at that site. Um, you know, that kind of came out of the recreation folks who were like, this is a great place for recreation. We said, that's also a great place for housing. So, um, so that kind of spurred being able to be an active player in housing, but we also wanted to do more with private housing projects and Isabel circle is one. And that's pro and that's a project that's currently waiting for us 
uh, you and I to talk about these development agreements because they need a development agreement for their project to start moving forward. And the issue we had was we really don't have any policies to help guide us. So we're going to have a discussion tonight on the local development agreements so we can set a policy so we can help move some private projects forward. Um, we need to, there, there's a, there's an economic barrier. So there's a regular, there are regulatory barriers out there. Um, and whether it's local or, or act 250, they come up from time to time. Um, but there are also, uh, economic barriers and this is a development agreement a way that we're going to help to, to alleviate that. The second one we have is, a, is, uh, we were going to come in tonight with also a discussion of the tax stabilization policy, but what we learned after putting together, uh, Josh did a thorough review of our tax stabilization policy and had a number of recommendations that he thought we could have to make a better policy, but we it's actually been voted on as to what the policy is going to be. So in order for us to make a change to that, we'd have to actually go back to the voters to get authorization for the council to give us permission to do. So we were like, that's a little too much to talk about tonight. But I did want to just preface it that the tax stabilization policy, it's another tool in the toolbox for us to be able to say, how can we help private um, housing developers on projects? Um, but we need to really amend our tax stabilization policy to give us that flexibility, to give you the ability to give us the flexibility to um, work with property owners on tax stabilization. So those are two big ones. Again, is that going to be enough? We're going to have to find out. Uh, we're hoping it is. I would say the the third big piece that I don't know if it's in this one or if it's in a different one is just um, the direct outreach to property owners. Um, Josh does that already on a regular basis, trying to build relationships with people. We have a number of vacant space in our downtown uh, in a few certain buildings. We'd love to see those get redeveloped. Um, and it's just building relationships with people to get them comfortable with wanting to go and try to invest some money into some housing in those in those spaces. So um, one thing is if we, if we be, when we get to having a discussion of tax stabilization agreements, a part of it's going to need to be an overall primer on what tax stabilization agreements are, because I know it seemed like when I first came out the first few years, I was on the council. We dealt with several proposals for tax stabilization agreements, and I was on a committee to work on redesigning them. But uh, I, I wouldn't assume that people know a lot about that stuff. No, it's it's kind of like talking about tax and TIF, which is um, tax increment financing. They're both similar tools. They're very powerful tools, but they take a bit of time to go and actually explain the nuances of how they work um, and how they benefit and protect the community at the same time. But it's always important to know the details of those. Uh, one question that occurred to me um, as I was going over this, um, we have a bullet for create and apply for a new TIF program. Does Is the creation of the new growth center designation subsumed in that or should that be broken out as a separate uh separate step you know because we've been for country club road we've sort of been thinking about the three-step process of zoning which we did tonight then growth center then tiff uh yeah um it'll be a part of that that tiff step we will have to do the growth center to do the tiff the tiff will be larger than the well currently the growth center includes the Sabins Pasture Parcel, which is adjacent to Country Club Road. We need to add Country Club Road to the growth center, add it to the larger area, and then there'll be at least four or five parcels that would be then in the TIF district. So um, TIF is not just for the Country Club Road piece. It is also for Sabins Pasture, and it's also for um, the piece next to them. And... Um, it would be for the piece of Steve Ribellini's parcel that is the one that we added into our um, new urban new urban yep. residential district. And so there could be other possibilities. When we talk about TIF, we can talk about, do we want to add this piece or that piece that's also adjacent to that? It'll have to be 
an adjacent and it'll have to be part of the project. And it would have to be something that adds increment. So it's got to be a place that we know there's going to be some mm -hmm. development going on that we can count on as increment which is new taxes. When I say increment, we're talking about new taxes because new taxes will be used to pay the bond that builds the infrastructure. Thanks. Adrian, did you have your hand up a minute ago? I mean, I just had a quick question. I don't know if it, you mentioned it, so I'm going to ask it. <laughs> um, you talked about the uh, vacancy space in downtown. Do we know what the vacancy rate is for downtown? And then what is what is the goal? Is the goal to have a hundred percent filled in terms of space in our downtown? And then how, what's the plan to get to that? I I don't think in this case, there's, there's a goal. It's just, we know of certain buildings that have been kind of long-term vacant. It's kind of like um, when I got here in 2014, we all talked about the the French block across the street and that it had been vacant for 75 years. And can't we do something about getting housing in there? We have a couple other buildings. It isn't a matter of looking at every single place to make sure every single building is 100% occupied. It's really a matter of looking at a handful or a couple of significantly vacant and underutilized buildings. Um, and so there are these certain opportunities that that exist there that we could go through if, if we can get property owners to be interested in redeveloping that we might be able to, to make some differences in. And that's really where we're trying to, you know, we'll always work with anybody. If somebody's got, got an idea and they want to bring it to us, we're always welcome to help, you know, with, with a unit here or a unit there or a space here. But, you know, if somebody has 70 or 80% of their place, um, and most of these don't actually have units, they're just space. So it's not like they've got 16 apartment units and they've only got two of them rented. These are just space big space that has, you know, we're just like, it would be great for you to renovate this space, make them into apartments. And it would probably cost this much and you'd make this much money and we can help set you up with, you know, developers and we can help set you up with property managers so you don't have to worry about it, but you've got a lot of space and we could, we could benefit, the community could benefit by having that space converted into residential. Just to follow up, is there any incentives we can provide to those owners to develop those properties? That's where the housing trust fund comes in. That's where we could put money into a project uh, um, to make things happen. But it's also, in some cases, um, that's where the tax stabilization comes in. Is sometimes somebody's like, well, if I fix up my building, I'm going to have to pay more in taxes. Well, the tax stabilization says, all right, well, we can stabilize it for a period of time. And if you fix up your building, we're not going to raise your taxes. Um, you can still, still have to pay your education taxes. We can't stabilize those. We don't have the power to do that, but we can stabilize your municipal taxes. One more follow-up, sorry. <laughs> so many questions at this hour. <laughs> Usually I'm asleep. Um, is there a, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but is there, I don't, I'm going to say it because I don't know what other word to use, but like a fine for these buildings that are vacant, that aren't being utilized for housing or commercial purposes, I have no idea what that would be called, but like there's space that we have, like, is there something negative that would happen to those owners? I don't know how to call what to call it. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> right. Okay. The buildings are producing. So you'd think there'd be some incentive. Right. It make their properties viable yeah. but I mean, it, these are the bad boys on the list you're down to like you're talking about five we can't talk about who they are what the addresses are like on at these meetings but we all know who they are and it, they're just tough situations so. oh, okay i don't know the yeah. backstory but yeah i mean i think it's one of those things where and this it's actually that's a great question because just thinking about all you know you'll hear a lot of times you know why doesn't couldn't the city just put housing on such and such a lot or, you know, couldn't the city just put housing on Sabin's pasture? So couldn't the city just convert that building? Well, th these are privately owned buildings. And so the building owners have to want to do them or have to want to sell them to someone who is interested in doing or want to partner with someone or get partner with us to get the grants that would help them do that. You know, the, the, the French block that Mike talked about, you know, um, was owned by this family, the Dickies and, they bought it 75 years ago. They had owned Arbuchons and you know, they paid a small 
tiny sum of money to build a building. They, they owned the building outright. They were just getting cash from a lease. There was no financial incentive whatsoever for them to, to take on the huge project it was going to take to renovate that upstairs. But it was a fire hazard. It was a, you know, a major community concern. And we tried every trick we could think of to convince the Dickies to do something. And it was really only after they sold it to the Obshan Corporation, who then said, we didn't buy this building, have vacant up space upstairs. They said, what can you do? And then we connected them with Downstreet and we got grants and da-da-da-da and put together a housing project. So now it's a condo and they don't own it and it's developed and there's people living there. But, it, you know, and so it's great. The, the city helped do that, but the owner did too. And, you know, I think that the idea that if someone has a, you know, yes, we hate to see vacant buildings, but we don't find people who have vacant land that aren't doing something right. You could be building something on your land, right? I mean, it's, they're choosing not to. So I don't know. I, I, it's tough. I mean, I think we can do something if it's a, if it's a public safety hazard, then it becomes a different ball game. But if it's just landlords choosing not to rent it, but there has been a there have been people ta over the years talked about well can't we do some kind of tax on uh, vacant properties uh, that would be above the uh, regular tax that people pay and that certainly is some I don't know if we would we I'm sure we don't have the authority to do that without uh, getting a charter change or I assume we don't but. That doesn't mean it's not something we could discuss. And at this point, we're trying to keep everything positive out of our office. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, it's a lot easier to, con to 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 just continue to build relationships and try to to you know groom these relationships in hopes that we can eventually have a breakthrough um, in one or more of these opportunities. And we don't know when that'll happen, but we hope at some point. Um, it, it'll work out, but that is a part of what we do on a regular basis as a part of, you know, it's not specifically on this list, but that's, those are some of the other, other things that we would do. How do we get more housing? Sometimes it's just making sure we keep picking up the phone every four, four or five months to go and say, Hey, you know, haven't, haven't heard from you in a little while. What do you think about this idea? Is this something that you think might be helpful to have elected officials as part of these conversations you can say hey so and so the mayor and i would like to come over and talk to you about what you could do about your property would that be a net positive or a net negative i think i think bill and i would just have to have a sit down conversation on a case by case basis to decide on the person to make sure it's mm -hmm. <laughs> to make sure it's a you, you know in, in some cases, you know, people might have more positive relationships with some folks than others. Um, so, and frankly, we do that now. I mean, if we have a situation and somebody, you know, even within our, you know, if one of us has a better relationship with an individual than another, we'll be like, well, that's the person that we'll call or, mm -hmm. you know, or, if, you know, and gee, you know, Jack McCullough knows them really well. We'll see if we can get Jack to reach out or, you know, Tim knows them. Let's see if we can, you know, any, any of, you know, it's like, I, we always try to, it's a small enough community that if there's a personal connection there. Or if there's a, if there's a situation that comes up where they're concerned, like, um, gee, we don't know if we're going to actually get support from the council on on this action to, to rezone the property. And it's like, well, how about we bring in Jack to sit down and, and have him, you know, he's only one voice, one person, one vote, but let's have Jack come in and sit down and talk to you about your project. So, you know, those those will happen from time to time just to – Maybe not with specifically with the zoning change, but for different different projects that might come up. So going through this, you know, I, I keep thinking that what we're talking about when we do the strategic planning is what are we going to use the city council's time to uh, to work on things to ad advance initiatives and and. Secondarily, what are we going to use our city staff's time, which is also a limited resource? You know, we saw the six people who work in your department. Um, but so going down the list, any amendments to zoning uh, regulations, clearly 
for the, to make those happen, that's the city council. Uh, revising the housing trust fund guidelines will come to the city council and we have to do that. We started working on the short-term rental ordinance. Um, we're going to be looking at some program recommendations and development agreements tonight. Um, is there anything on, on the list that uh, either you don't think is within your capacity, the capacity of your department to do, or people on the council don't think is something that we should, that deserves to be on this uh, uh, this list of uh, strategy items. Pellin. Question to Bill, and he um, provide um, answer uh, to the city council, uh, but there's a discussion if. Uh, there are any alternatives to TIF application. So anything might create less financial burden on taxpayers. Maybe we can add next to apply for a new TIF item and just like talk about if there are, what are they? If no, we this uh, TIF is the best alternative. Why? Just to um, inform public in a more detailed way. So if it is okay with the planning committee and the yeah, I mean, I think certainly we would be so so again, none of this says uh, like this does say apply for, but you these are things that you would need to approve this list of things um, from from where I said of having sort of taken my marching orders from you folks, you've you have sort of advanced the plan. you approved the the work plan on Country Club Road, which was included the the zoning and the the um, growth, center. growth center, thank you, and the TIF. So we would be working toward that, but we have to get the growth center done first. You know, we would come in and do a presentation about TIF before we actually made the application. You would have to approve the application. So that would be a good time to talk about it. You know, I think the question of, of the financial burden, the, the burden is if we're going to put up money and it's going to come back from new tax revenue. So you know, how do we assure that that we're covered? Um, because there, there is a little bit of risk there. And, um, but if if we don't do, I mean, I suppose we could just put it in and hope that the tax revenue comes, or I was like, I think I said, or we just tell the developer, you've got to do it all, but then the project either doesn't become viable or we get a whole different kind of project than what, you know, we were, we get one that is that much more expensive because that's what the, the, the real estate can, you know, oh, we put a, $2 million homes and we can make this pencil out. We can't do it with the 300 units that you want. Um, so, you know, we have to consider those things. So, I, um, like I said, we don't have a lot of choices either. It's not like there's, we have seven development programs to choose from. I mean, we have TIF and then the local development agreement is basically a mini TIF. It's just, you know, junior TIF um, and tax stabilization. And that's, you know, that's kind of it. And then whatever grants we can get or tax credits that might exist, you know, that the state offers that we can apply for on behalf of people. We don't have many local choices ourselves under state law. Lauren. Um, one question I had uh, for Mike. The consider city plan program recommendations. I mean, is that a whole other suite of policy ideas? Is that more like projects? Just what, like, what might we anticipate seeing under that? Because that seems like a big possible other umbrella. <laughs> uh, they're, they're actually very similar to what you see here. Um, and probably from your perspective, what it really is, is paying attention and, um, contributing to the city plan process. So Sam, um, housing is the topic for May 13th. So whether it's at that meeting or before or after people see the implementation strategies that are laid out, you'll probably see a lot of them are very similar to these. Um, and those are looking at an eight year window. This is looking at a one year window. So the difference is you might see more things, you might see more detail of things, but the idea is over the next eight years, this is where we want to move towards. And if there are things that it's like, we should also be doing this or we shouldn't be doing that, that's the input that the Planning Commission is going to be looking for. 
but I don't think we'll be voting to add anything from the city plan program recommendations. Thanks, that's really helpful. I mean, I think this seems like a good list. I don't, it seems like that they're all conversations worth having given, you know, that this is such a huge community need and priority of the council. So, I mean, I, again, it seems like a big, <laughs> a big list with your small team, Mike, but it just seems all worth pursuing. And for me, everything here is something that is a step toward some concrete outcome. Um, so, but that that's in terms of, you know, uh, Adrian, you're talking about, well, how do we measure where, where we got, well, we'll know what happens at Country Club Road because prop the housing goes there or not. Um, okay. Page on these. Or... Sorry, uh, it's a little bit, it's just redundant from the last one, but it just shows you what's up next. We were um, you know, talking about housing tonight. We'll talk about resiliency at the next meeting and so on. Um, and so we'll keep going until it's complete and um, we'll be complete with these presentations. In June, we'll bring back a summary of what we've discussed and provide a little bit more clarity, um, and then also report out on this iteration of the strategic plan. And just one of the other, so that list that you see that we just went by, um, just like with the infrastructure, you know, you'll start seeing those in my in the weekly report where it projects out future agenda. It'll either be on the pending list or they'll start seeing them on calendar dates. So that's that's we're building out our council meeting work plan for the rest of the year by saying this is important enough to do. Because yeah, I recall last at our last meeting, we decided, well, rather than vote yes on one package each week, we would look at the whole package at the end. And so I don't know if we, but I, I do want to have as much of a chance for discussion about these items tonight as we can, recognizing that we can come back and in in four or five meetings say, oh, you guys have it all wrong. We, we changed our minds. We're going we're gonna to go for the million dollar houses on Country Club Road. I think the main thing for us would be if there's something that people really don't want to do, the sooner we know that, the better. Or if there is a disagreement or a um, you know a lack of clarity over something, and you you, you all want to make clear amongst yourselves what you mean by something, then those are the things most helpful. I, you know, most of this stuff is stuff we 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 had already talked about. Really, all of this stuff. I mean, it is a lot, but it's also it's been in the queue kind of anyway. And so, if there's something new you'd like to add and take something out, those kind you know that's what this is the check in. Is this meeting your goals? Right? Is this what you want to do, or is there something that ought to be added to this? Something should be taken off. You know, this is, you have a goal for wanting to create more housing based on the conversations we've all had. This is, this is what's on the list. Or is this correct or not? And this is, you know, again, you can think about it now and we'll come back to it, but those are the kind of things that are helpful for us. Cause if it's, if it's like, Hey, we really just don't want to do tax stabilization. Great. They'll just save us not having to do it. Right. So I'm not recommending that, but <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And then Lauren. Session we did it, 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 it's still, there's no timeline associated with these. So some of these are items that would be in the one year plan and some could be the three, yeah, four, those, five. You'll be getting those. Are, right. But in terms of us helping set goals and priorities, it's still just a long list because we really haven't given you any or much feedback on what are the most important items versus Confluence Park, which is on the list because it stays on the list. But as far as I'm concerned, it should be kind of some below the last line. Um, but, you know, th there are things, it's like, how do we take a list this big in one night and absorb it and then really give you the feedback you need? I guess is kind of what I'm trying to figure out. Because um, like we just walked away from the last one and probably it's worth talking about at some point what items are at least the least important to us. Because everything we brought up that we talked about, people kind of mentioned there was always another reason why I should stay. But still, I think there was some underlying feeling of 
that's not as important. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> you know, I think on this list, um, you know, it's possible that, um, you know, the short-term rental ordinance would be looking at the workload that, that is based here. Can we add more things like this right now um, to make a statement? Because it seems like that's what we're trying to make with it, but it could be a pretty expensive, time-consuming statement. Uh, so to me, I would that wouldn't be in the top priorities on this list. Uh, and possibly, you know, the the tax program might be one that's going to take a lot of time, so that might not fit our workload this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, unless you think you need it to help make some of the developers be able to do their piece to get whether it's Country Club Road or Habitat for Humanity or Bove or whoever right. to get yeah. some of these projects going. Yeah. So, so I I do appreciate that, and I think you know again we can maybe give some thought to how maybe at the end of this maybe we go you know once we've reviewed all of them and see you know then take a look and you know i don't know use dots or, you know prioritize somehow each in each one you know, think of some way to at least even if it doesn't mean taking them off at least putting them in numerical order somehow or you know so that would be helpful but as i you know i look at this for example um you know currently we did we did just do the amendments to the zoning regulations if we want to take on more later then that would be fun housing trust guidelines i mean i think that's probably mostly going to be work that comes from the housing committee and they'll bring it to the council but it means that it would be on one of your agendas the short term rental ordinance i mean you already voted tonight to have it come back so we're already committed to do some work there the city plan you know they're working through that no matter what, and probably won't be the final version won't be coming to us till fall at the earliest. Uh, so CCR has been our top priority, actual hands-on project because we're putting all we have into that, which does require growth center, but the TIF wouldn't be until fall probably. Funding, that's really a budget thing. You know, um, do we want to put more money in the housing trust fund next year when we do the budget? It's already kind of set for this year with nothing. So that doesn't really require a lot of work unless it's an analyzing what we might do with that. Um, advanced housing projects on city-owned land. That's basically Country Club Road and 1216 Main Street, which we're talking about in a few minutes. We don't really have, you know. And the um, Berry Street Rec Center. Berry Street Rec Center, right. If if that's, if that were if, to. Yeah. If that's, so that's, that would be a longer term out. That's kind of all tied into the different CCR stuff. And then you've got the development agreement policy, which Mike will outline tonight, and tax stabilization, which, um, you know, we are, it's probably due for an uphaul, and we've got some, you know. So, yes, it's a long list, and it's not the, the biggest one of, you know, the CCR project is bigger than all the rest of them combined. You know, that's the big nut, and that's, but that also makes sense. That's our big investment. That's the one we control. So, and so TIFF goes with that. In the, the development agreement again we can talk about well we, we will talk about it at some point the less i talk now the sooner we'll get to talk about the others <laughs> um, yeah so i think it might be helpful for us um as a recommendation i know that we're gonna approve all these at the end as one list but it might be nice to see them kind of as what tim and bill were saying like I'm thinking of the variable that would be really helpful for us. I'm just going to propose this to help make decisions, right? So I think of the effort, like what is the effort this would take? What is the impact that it will, you know, what is the, what is the effort and impact? What is the cost? What is the time that is, right? So it's the cost of doing these, you know, policies, these programs, what is the resources that are needed and what is the expected outcome I'm thinking like resources as like people resources, like time, staff, right? So if we had a full list with like a matrix that like outlined those recommended variables, there might be others, but I think that would help prioritize and, and bring to light, you know, some of these, um, you know, like, you know, the short-term rental ordinance you're going to share with us at the May meeting, that might take a lot of effort in terms of staff time, but what is the impact? What is the cost? What is the personal personnel resource of that? Like, I think it'd be really nice to weigh those variables that will help 
us be more informed to make a educated decision. Okay. Thanks folks. I think that, that oh, Lauren, sorry. That was more back to the list um, was just Tim had mentioned that the housing committee has a couple other things. I mean, I'm wondering if we should, there's consider city plan program recommendations. Maybe it's like just adding to one of those like and housing committee recommendations. Just, it sounds like we're going to be seeing like maybe an infill proposal or some other things, which I don't know if any of them would require council action or whatever, but it just seems like we should be naming everything that we anticipate if we already know of some. I think um, if you look at the, time. there's a, like a blue list that mm -hmm. was in your packet that kind of lays out a number of things and including like initiative 2.1.2 says consider housing committee recommendations. And there's a bullet for revised housing trust fund guidelines and new short-term rental ordinance. We could certainly add if there are additional bullets. I mean, and certainly not something that we're going to say, well, it wasn't on the list. We're not going to consider it. So, but I mean, I think yeah, I'm just thinking like this, this is actually point, a little bit better. In our limited list time, of, it yeah. feels like better to be as comprehensive if we already know things are coming. Um, just so we're assessing it all within the context, but. Okay, thanks folks. Next up. Oh, <laughs> just gonna stop share and get some lights on. 12 to 16 Main Street. Hey, I get to hand this off to Josh and get a breather here. And while Josh is getting set up, um, I, uh, this might be a good time to check in with people on, uh, on time and items left on the agenda. So we have 12 to 16 main street discussion of development ag agreements, congressionally directed spending grant committee proposal for amending the city, uh, stipend use, uh, policy that kind of seems like a lot, but I know I'm also someone who, my bedtime is probably later than a lot of other people's bedtime. So uh, don't necessarily rely on me for what we should keep on the agenda. Lauren. I mean, I think number 14 and 15, the grant committee and stipend conversation, maybe we could push. Um, I know the congressionally directed spending is time sensitive and just continuing with all of continuing on the same theme that we had all night and with the staff that we have here seems to make sense. Um, and then punt the last two. So Adrian, you were out of the room when we were discussing about well, <laughs> what we were talking about. Should we keep everything on the agenda that's on the agenda and Lauren suggesting pushing uh, items 13 and 14, 14 or 14 and 15 off to the next meeting and and Carrie um, 14 was yours and I wonder how you feel about that 15 is scary sorry well yeah okay um yeah that's all right okay we will take uh 14 and 15 off tonight and put it uh, on for next time. Thank you. Okay, Josh. Hi, uh, Josh Trome, Community and Economic Development Specialist. Um, wanted to circle back around with 12 to 16 Main Street. Um, that is the former beverage baron location. And we have completed the lot line adjustment to create a separate parcel. Um, I think the uh, plat was submitted to you guys to show what that parcel looks like. It's right around 6,600 square feet. Um, so the pins have been set and it was the intention um, of council um, to have that lot um, be designated as itself for development. And so we're just coming back here to ask that question again, what, what do you guys want to do with that that parcel? Do you want to still develop it? What are and if you do, what are some of the things that you would like to see um, in that structure? Um, 
things that would be included in an RFP that would be sent out to a developer. And right. maybe some history. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, some history. The city acquired that property um, in the actually in the whole transit center project because that was required. We needed that land for the bike path to go through. That's also when we straightened the road out that goes up behind there and that we took down the, uh, the Montpelier Beverage Building and created, it opened up this green space that exists today. Uh, and at the time, there was some discussion whether it should remain green space, whether it should be developed, what should we do? And, and so that tied into the downtown master plan. And the conclusion at that time was it should be developed. It was an active part of the downtown. And so uh, we brought that to the city council a couple of years ago. So, uh, and at that point it was, yes, let's move forward with developing it for sale uh, with the idea that it would be housing with potential either retail or office, depending on what the market were for the first floor. It, it, if it could be all re housing, great. If it couldn't be, um, then you know, we, we, they were, council was open to some different use on the first floor. Um, and the only other piece that was involved in that, that at one point, because of the nature of the federal funding, uh, it had to been, if we, if it had to have remained in transport, active transportation use, but we, the city council chose to buy out that interest. So we did pay some money uh, to VTrans to, basically repay for the federal funds that purchased that person. So we own it outright with no restrictions on its use. So that, it, so I think, and the council did that with the anticipation that that was an, an investment that they would get a return on with a sale. But that decision was made a couple of years ago, at least four different council members were in this room. This whole majority of the council was different. So we wanted to make sure that this current council wanted to do that or not, or if you want to do something different, but we are now, all the administrative things have been done. We're ready to move forward. So we're just checking in. Are we on the same path or not? Tim. There's a building designed to improve this site, right? Yeah, it was designed specifically for Montpelier Beverage, but yes, there is a building that got permits uh, and certainly could be used as a basis for, you know, someone would probably alter it because it had a loading dock for the, you know, oh, yeah, the, yeah. the recycling and things out back. But I think in general, yes, I think it could be. So with the lot could... line adjustment you did, does that change the way that building would fit or it, is it it's still okay? Very minor. It's a very minor change. The only real change from that design to the actual um, lot line adjustment is we, there's an easement right on the corner there um, because the sewer city sewer line runs underneath there. And we we sort of cut the property line off so that we would maintain ownership. I wondered why you did. Okay. Yep. Yeah. We didn't want the sewer line to be running underneath somebody's building. And the old shared driveway easements that are in there, that's from when it was multiple lots in the past. Yep. And I <clears throat> I'm wondering about this, you know, because I, I see uh a lot of the development pattern of downtown is buildings just right up against each other one by one all the all the way to the end are, are we thinking that something like that could happen uh or would there be space between the building that the drawing board is in and uh so and the are, next building there are two issues with that one is that there is a shared you know there are rights that drawing board building has rights to a right away through there and it's a shared alleyway and the second issue is you know, there are residential units there as well. Now, I know there's plenty of residential, you know, so it would be blocking windows and those kinds of things. So it would, I mean, potentially if it could be negotiated that, you know, uh, that would probably be up to the new owner to try to cut a deal with that building owner to get rid of that alleyway and do that. But we don't envision that happening. We see that that the, the way it sits on the ground right now, there would, there would be that alley. There'd be an alleyway and... Some kind of commercial space, probably on the first floor, and and how many floors up? There's three, but it could mm -hmm. be up to. I think six. six is allowed downtown. So. Yeah, and, and the the other thing we need to do with maintaining the alleyway between the drawing board and the new building, and we'd obviously have to work with the beards to make sure we can. We would like to remove that as a as a road access to turn it just into a 
pedestrian access to have that clarified, but it has to be for pedestrians. We, we own a municipal parking lot in back and there are no sidewalks to get to the city street. So we would like to turn that alleyway, reserve that alleyway and turn it into basically a pedestrian alleyway. Um, so that way we maintain our handicapped accessibility from the back to the front, because actually, if you look at that, there is no sidewalk on that side where the new road was built. There's no sidewalk there. So, um, and there's no connection from the parking lot to the bike path. So we would have to maintain some kind of path through there. But that would be something we would negotiate with, you know, whatever as the project moves forward, if that was a project. So. Okay. Tim. So I have managed the building for beers since 1983. <laughs> is that uh, the is that the drawing board building? Yeah. Okay. Um so I, in terms of I don't know if I have a constant. I don't think I do at this I point. I don't think so. But, I don't think so, but it's good to disclose it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be in favor of making a motion that we pursue the RFP project and, um, with the caveat that we get this we can get a building that would be on the whole paying property on the tax roll. And providing housing too, right? And providing yeah. housing. Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Is there a price? Is that something that would be decided now or I'm not quite sure, Bill. I I would think that we would bear bait well. If they vote for us to proceed, we would put that out. I think we would ask for proposals and see what we get. We can always we would have the right to accept yeah, it. We could do that. We could. Yeah, we need to guide the process a little. I don't. Yeah, we could. Maybe yeah. we should include an appraisal in there too. Yeah, that's a good idea. Actually. Should I add that to my motion that we need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no one seconded it yet. So okay. Well, do so please make it make it big. Okay, so it's seconded by uh, Lauren. So right. So we'll prepare the RFP, get an appraisal, and uh, review all that. Yep, but come we'll, back to council we'll, with that. Mm -hmm. Well, at least let them know. I don't know that you'll need it. If assuming they approve this, I don't think they need to approve it again. But we should let them know at okay. least, and then get it. See what the proposals are, and then. And Carrie. Um, I am not a hundred percent sure what the motion is, <laughs> so I would love to have it kind of clarified. Um, but I will just say that I, I feel pretty easy about this. I want to see it developed. I want it to include housing. That's kind of what I care about. Um. I'd, I'd prefer that we don't put a whole lot of other restrictions on it other than that. But so, so if I could just know what the, what the motion actually is, that'd be helpful. Uh, to uh, move the RFP project, the caveat that uh, we get a building that will be a full paying property on the tax rolls and provides, provide housing and uh, have a, have the city do an appraisal. At least I think that's what it is. Okay. It's so, so we're not going to be we're not going to specify that it should or shouldn't have commercial enterprise on the bottom floor or anything like that. We're going to leave that open. Yeah. Okay. But Good. I think what we've said is we wouldn't we wouldn't prevent that. Right. 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 Okay. Sounds good. Any other discussion? Mm -hmm. This is, the, this is going to be the fastest item of tonight, even faster than, than the consent agenda. All those in favor, signify. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So All right. Real, great. Real action step. Yeah. That's great. All right. Item 12, development agreements. Sorry, Mike, you didn't get that much of a break. <laughs> That's okay. You start drinking coffee at 5 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> you start seeing me nodding off. Um, so uh development agreements. I I don't know how much you've had an opportunity to go and read through the material I gave you. I tried to put together originally I was gonna try to put together a, an actual policy. And so then I just started you know, kind of dumping my brain into this in more of an FAQ. And I thought this actually works well as an explanation for people to understand what development agreements are. So, um, you know, what are we hoping to try to achieve? You know, this is um, going to try to increase housing and it can be used for economic development as well. Um, 
it's expensive to develop, adds expensive, uh, and it requires infrastructure, which costs a lot of money. That cost then goes into the housing. So, you know, if a developer has to put in a million dollars worth of infrastructure, they just divide that among the housing units that they're going to build, and that costs those costs get passed along. So, if we can work with a developer to have us pay those costs, then the housing becomes more affordable or the economic development project pencils out. That's really a little bit of, of, and what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do is to have a policy that allows us to um, negotiate and work. Obviously any development agreement has to be approved by city council. We just, we just need the policies so we can negotiate things and bring them back to you and say, this meets your policy. And then there's uh, questions and answers that can go from there. Right now, we don't have a policy. We did a similar project to this for Caledonia Spirits. They needed a water line moved and upgraded. We spent $120,000 doing it. We knew that they were going to be going a, to be a big house, a big water user. And it turns out they paid back that money. They didn't really pay it back. They just paid their water bill as right. they always so the, do. So and we used that water agreement, to pay those agreement. Water line, there might have been some sewer stuff, and there was also a road connections the city put in two or three pieces of infrastructure and the combination of their new taxes their new water fees and their new sewer line were anticipated to pay it and it was it was actually calculated with a 10-year payback and they paid it back within five or th th that revenue was covered those costs within five because it was higher than initially anticipated so that is the the that's basically it is that the city can do these things um but it's, yeah, it really kind of comes down to, I, I tried to lay out as many questions and answers as I could, you know, kind of, you know, what is it? It's kind of, it's a legally binding contract. We sign a contract with somebody and they say, we agree to do this. And the city signs our name on the bottom of the line and say, we agree to do this. And um, so any, any developer, any project can can go for it as long as they need public goods. So infrastructure. So we don't, buy down people's debt. We don't do other things like that. Uh, other other states have rules that allow you to do that. Um, we are just going through and saying, if the reason you need a help is because you, you have an infrastructure need, and that could be sidewalks, that could be storm sewer, that could be water, sewer, roads, uh, could be, it could be parkland. It could be, there are a number of things that, that people could have a need for. Um, it's essentially a public, a public infrastructure that's necessary for the private project. So we can put our money to the public portion of it. It's really the almost exact same thing as TIF, except this would be only with local funds. Not we wouldn't have access to the education fund, um, and so that's the difference. Is it? So that's why we call it sometimes a mini TIF or a junior TIF because it's it's the same idea. Just to be really clear about the risk not i mean you'll get a policy i thought and i strongly recommend you direct us to come back to you with a policy because i think it is one of the only tools we have but just so we're clear we were able to do it with caledonia spirits because we had various funds on hand to do that that won't always be the case so stonewall meadows or something like that might need you know a million dollars to put in infrastructure we might need to float a bond for this so just so that people understand if we're doing these things, we're going to have to upfront money. We don't have that kind of cash on hand necessarily. So it will require, you know, the public to support this. It will be based on, so there could be more, you know, bond votes. There could be more of these things. So it would mean it, it is what it's, what it means when we talk about how can we support development? How can we be aggressive? That's, those are, those are the kind of actions. If we don't want to do that, that's great. We don't, we don't have to, and we won't be as aggressive as we could be in trying to promote development. So it's it's not there's no right or wrong, it's just that's what this is. It's putting money up with, and again we can have performance bonds, we have contracts, we can have whatever you need to try to. Admit a, yeah, how do we? Yeah, one of the risk. questions for any development agreement that council will have when they come up is, um, what assurances do we have that the developer will meet their end of the deal? So somebody's putting in a housing development, they want us to put in the sewer and water lines. And we say, we we run all the numbers and we're like, well, as long as we get 20 housing units, we're going to have enough water revenues coming in to pay for the water line bond. If we get a 20-year bond for water, 
everything works out. Now the question is, how do we guarantee they're actually going to put in the 20 housing units? Because we could put in all the water and sewer lines, and they go and sell two lots and build four housing units, and we're still paying the bond. So there's risk to us. But where we have to all sit down, or you have to sit down as a, as a council, is to make a decision of where's, how do we mitigate that risk as much as we can. In some cases, it's it's a surety bond. Some cases, it's something we know. Some cases, you know, we just have to talk about various options. Um, there, there are risks. The property too. There are risks. Yeah, <laughs> there could be a, a mortgage that goes through and says, if you fail to deliver on your end, we get take ownership of four or five of the lots, and then we hire a builder to build on them, so we get our our uses. But we have to come up. That's where development agreements have their risk. Um, but where this policy comes in is um, so there'll be always two questions that'll come up when we especially big ones. One is where are we getting the money? And the second one is how do we mitigate our risk? Um, but this is where a lot of projects, this is where the rubber meets the road on a lot of these projects. When we talk about how can we help um, the one on Northfield street um, habitat. habitat, that's, you know, well, boy, if the city could put in the, the sewer in the roads where we could put 120 housing units up there, it's like, well, the numbers all work out, but how can we guarantee you're going to put 120 housing units up there? Because if you only put 60, we're going to be left holding the bag. Um, we never got there with that project. It hasn't gotten to that point, but we've got a deck that's a big example of, okay, how do we, you know, and that comes down to the question, how do we help how private housing projects happen? Well, this is one way we do that. So is there a menu or you've seen these before? Is there, uh, is there a menu of items that should be in a development agreement policy and is that what we would expect you to be coming back with this laid out a number of examples that we thought were okay like uh you know small one of them is like for small expenses using revolving loan fund which has a payback of five years or less so mm -hmm. if somebody comes in it's like look i, I just need fifty thousand dollars worth of help to make my project happen we have a revolving loan fund. We could make those loans as long as they have. And the key for us from an administrative standpoint, from a staff standpoint, is we're looking at the paybacks. Uh, what is an okay payback um, for a certain amount of money? A small amount of money, five-year payback. Um, you know, If something's not going to generate that much, we'll use water revenue again. We're going to put in a big expense for a water line that's going to have a small payback. It's going to have a 45-year payback not a really good payback. You know, we probably shouldn't be, you know, what's our policy say? Our policy says, if you're going to spend this much, it's got to have a payback in this range. Then we can work with the numbers to make sure what, when we bring it to you, um, it meets whatever our payback. And I think it had in here, uh, medium projects could be loaned um, up to 10 year paybacks. Um, you know, and then larger projects that require bonding could have a 20 year payback. And that's what, when we worked with public works, they were like, our, our water plant and our sewer plant both operate about 50% capacity. We have a lot of capacity. So if, as a utility, as an enterprise fund, we want more users. So Kurt wants more users. He wants more people to hook onto the system, but he does have to make sure that water line, um, is going to pay for itself within that 20 year window, because if it's not, then it's, it's doesn't work for him. And if it's a road, roads have to get paid every paved every 15 years. So if, if we're going to help pay for the construction of a new city street, a, we're going to have to account for the fact that we're going to have to be plowing it. And B, we have to also recognize it's got to have a really fast payback because we got to repay this thing every 15 years. So we can't have a 20 year bond <laughs> on a 15 year road. Mm -hmm. So well, those are the kind of, things those are the things know. that we need in the policy. So we and can you say, yep. set, and we'd recommend, and you would set, you know, what size project would actually even be enough to do this? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, or if there's do, a, you know, just everybody comes in and says, I want to put a house on my corner, you know, all due respect to your friend that has got the one place. Yeah, we probably wouldn't do that. But so it would. But if something's above a certain criteria and it meets the payback criteria, then you'd consider those. And again, the council would always have it's the same as tax stabilization. So you know, the council reserves the right to not approve these, and they don't have to. You know, just because you meet the policy doesn't mean you're guaranteed. It just means that we won't even bring it to the council if they don't meet the policy. 
So you're just looking for emotion to, to tell you to go back, right. develop uh, policy, to and this, come back. Yeah, this is something else. We have other stuff to do. If you'd rather we don't go down this road, tell us now. And mm -hmm. but this is we certainly a good example of a project we can help happen right now. Is there a policy? Have you seen a policy from any other communities that? Exist that you can. I tried very hard to find one, and I really most of them tied back to TIFs, and this isn't a TIF, and we're right. trying to avoid using the word TIF with this because there is actual statutory things for local TIFs, and they have limits yeah. and requirements and a whole bunch of things. So we're not calling this a TIF; we're calling them development agreements, and we're adopting it through a different statutory authority, so that way we can avoid. The problems that are created we do by have calling a couple it examples incident. of development agreements, though we had we had one with Downstreet and and uh, folks for the transit center. We had one with Caledonia Spirits, and we had actually had one with Capitol Plaza for the hotel yeah. project that didn't go. But this would be the policy to get this would be those. the policy to get us to those. But it right. would almost include what was in. Yeah, I tried with CBOEO. I think it's that the one that does the economic yeah. stuff for Burlington because I was watching in the newspapers and they were like, "Oh, we just did another one. We just had another development agreement." So I phone them and I emailed them and I was like, hey, do you guys have a policy that says what you approve and don't approve? And, and they, they never got they, back to me and any they policies don't. there. So it's all pretty much ad hoc. I think it's pretty much ad hoc, which is what how we've operated, but we it makes it really hard for us to work with people because we really as staff, we want to be able to tell them these, these are the policies and we would love to go to council and recommend approval of your project. Because it, takes, it meets and the, it takes guidelines. work as staff, you know, DPW has got to do some just preliminary costing and, you know, and they're willing, they like doing it, but they don't want to do, be chasing that every person comes in and says, you know, can I work out a payback? So, and we want to be sure that you're on board with doing these at the end of the day before we spend a lot of time coming. So, so the secret is just to have a simple kind of a clean outline mm -hmm. probably to guide you because Whatever it is, it's going to have to be a custom agreement every time we do. That's right. So. Yep. Yeah. And if if we had a development agreement where somebody came in and was like, I want to do this, they would come to us. We would review it. Does it meet the policies of the basic things? They would come to you. You guys would say, yes, um, we want to move forward. Bill gets authorized to take this to legal to write up the actual contract that we would later come back and, and, and sign. And there may be a condition in there that says, this one is going to require a bond vote. There's a condition of the agreement on our end that says it's contingent upon okay. approval of the voters. If the voters vote it down, the project goes down. Okay. And we'll, so we'll just be having special elections every month or so. Yeah. Lauren. <laughs> um, I guess I'm just, I mean, I, I think we should pursue it. I think it makes sense trying to have a policy. Um, is the state looking at this? Like if this is a the real barrier, like they just passed the house just passed a bill for like a hundred million more dollars for housing. Like, could they be putting money into a revolving loan fund for us? Or like are they looking at this? Is there any I mean I, like it's we, it's we are looking the small communities. It's like like just thinking of our budget, like from a few months ago to like so I like the idea. I just wish the state was doing more on this. And like, if they're not, and this is the real like rubber hits the road, another example of the barrier, like, should we be up there advocating that they be like supporting communities, helping fund these? Maybe it's like a state match to help with these projects or something. And I agree. You know, we, I mean, we did basically, well, I mean, we could, why don't we just decide what we're going to do funding it? Because so, that's a long conversation. We've had that with some of them about even on country club road it's like if you can fund the infrastructure we can make the rest of it happen and they just like mm -hmm. we, we don't know what program that fits into but. yeah and we've we've tried with the legislature to do project based tiffs which would also be another way of doing it and the, the legislature has balked at that but J josh is looking from the standpoint the ideal situation we would have is if we had a, a large pot of funds that we could use as a revolving loan fund um and so, you know, Josh has been looking at various ones, USDA and these different things. We haven't found one yet. We keep looking. Uh, we're kind of a little sidetracked now with the flooding, but we'll get back to it at some point to see if there's a grant we could get that would basically fund a revolving loan fund. And once we get it started, obviously, we could then allocate $50,000 a year into to, to just increase the fund over time. So it's much like our housing trust fund. We'd have a revolving loan fund for infrastructure. Um 
that we could loan to ourselves basically. And then we pay ourselves back and we loan it out and we pay it back. Then we don't have to worry about the bond side of things. We can mm -hmm. very quickly and efficiently move things out. Um, but that would be something to move towards in the future. For now, we just need to know we've got some rules. So I'll, you guys have this. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read it, read it. If you have questions, please send them to me. So I kind of have an idea of what is, uh, what are problems? What are the things that, um, because I'll have to turn this into a policy, figure out how to do that. Um, we'll be creative. Um, and then bring it back to you so we can move forward because we do have, as I said, Isabel Circle will be coming in very, very soon to look for assistance. And that's really what spurred this on. We really needed to kind of get a policy in place so we can move this forward. So we, once we've got the policy, then we can quickly take them and bring them in and say, here's here's your first example. So someone want to make a motion to tell the city to do this? Uh, I move we direct city staff to uh, develop a development agreement policy for us to consider. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Next up, the other... Form the the things formerly known as earmarks, right? <laughs> um, so the deadline for ear for the congressionally directed spending is um, Monday, and we developed a list. Although actually, it did occur to me that a revolving loan fund for housing and development might be something that we could add to it. Um, uh, maybe in conjunction with the infrastructure. Um, so our, these were our recommendations uh, for areas that we would look at, but obviously uh, we could, so that included flood recovery funds to fix some damaged sewer uh, pump stations, potentially elevate the downstreet buildings on Elm Street, which had first floor fund flooding. So I don't know, we were going to talk to Downstreet, and I think there was some interest there. Um, and I think the biggest one was, big one was to repair and replace all water lines using the new state um, engineering report that they've approved. And since we sent this, we actually got outreach from Senator Sanders' office saying that they they had talked to the state and the state had recommended this for uh, congressionally directed spending. So they basically asked us to apply for it. So we're gonna we're gonna put in for the whole thing uh, unless you said tell us not to. And then the district heat expansion, possibly the snow melt system, and then obviously Country Club Road. I spoke with two of the, you know, Sanders and Welch representatives, and they both said basically the same thing. Apply for, you know, the big ones that you need. Don't worry about dividing them up amongst us. Just send them all to all of us. We get together and divide them up and figure out who wants to support which ones and which ones we think there are programs that fit. Um, so... I think, you know, we tried to sort of have four or five items that were a reasonable list that were hitting some key priorities. Um, so, but uh, we don't want to apply for them without your approval and uh, and also your feedback or additions or subtractions. So that's All right, any, uh, Adrian? Yeah, I'll just comment. So I, I did spend some time doing some research on these congressional directed spending and what um, what has been approved, what projects are likely to be approved. And I think I really like the last one, the funds for infrastructure for the Country Club Road Project. I think that will have to be a very creative application, um, probably like a phased approach, because I don't think I'm just going to based on what they've funded in the past, that's probably not like a likely funded application. But I think if we take it from an approach of increasing housing in central Vermont, this is phase one, we're gonna have two phases and we're taking this approach. And this is the first critical step to you know, increase these units in central Vermont, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's exactly what we were okay. told was, you know, there fund there's funds for sort of fixing what's here, but 
less funds for putting new and expanded, yes. but unless you can really tie it to another need. And so it would be basically a housing application that said, this is what we need to get the housing. So. And just, um, I've written federal grants in my life and it's really hard to write a federal grant. And this is a lot of work in, so we've been writing a federal grant for my job for three months and it's an entire team of people. So what is the, you know, kind of a reality check to get one, two, three, four. I mean, I know the applications aren't, you know, a, a federal grant application, but you're still pulling in budgets, subject matter experts, pulling together what you want to accomplish by next Monday. Monday. So um, to the, to that, uh, at least one, one or two of these we submitted last year. So we have some work done. Um, and uh, the other thing, this particular uh, application is pretty straightforward. It's an application. You know, then they sometimes come back and want if if you're in the running, then you have more work to do. But just to get in the queue, uh, it's it's I mean it's it's a real deal, but it's not as onerous as the full package. And like I said, and we've really already been working on them. And I think the one that at least as we sit here today probably is the, the highest likelihood of success. The water line. You know, we just did the full. We have got the full report. The numbers. It's current. Um, so we're about as prepared as can be to proceed with that. So we're, we feel confident that we could do this. If, if we were to add something new, that would be a little challenging, even though I just offered to do it. <laughs> exactly. So is there a motion to approve this list? To approve um, the lists presented to city council. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Sorry? Fingers crossed. Yeah. This it would be so great if we could get some of this. Um other business. I don't think we have other business council reports. Start at your end. Pass, Carrie. Thanks. I just wanted to um, to just refer back to the public comment that we got at the very beginning of the meeting and um, the the really the racist comments that were made. And I appreciate the mayor you calling you know calling a little bit of attention to that. And um, I just I just wanted to be noted that um, I was pretty appalled at hearing what that the content of the of the comment and and yes it's public comment and people certainly have a right to to um, make whatever public comment they want but it um, did not uh, I, I I found it very disturbing and unfortunate that we had to hear that thanks uh, Tim Helen no report Lauren yes. Mayor's report, I have very little to say, except that uh, Bill may also cover this. The city manager and I were over at uh, the State House the other day for a press conference that the uh, Senate leadership uh, held to talk about all the uh, bills, the five bills they've uh, passed in the Senate to uh, respond to the flooding last year, and uh, it was a real opportunity for them to uh, celebrate what they had done, and we were there to make sure that uh, it has not been overlooked, that there are uh, 20 properties, 10 in Montpelier and 10 in Barrie, that uh, still have not been funded for uh, for property elevations and that's part of the uh what the house passed and i was glad that uh the first one of the first questions they got from a member of the press was well what about the people uh, the three and a half million dollars for uh elevations in barry and montpelier and so we 
expect that we'll have to continue to be there to make sure that uh, they, they don't forget about our residents who have been through so much. And uh, if we can get the money from the state budget, it will be uh, there right. It will be there on a much shorter timeline than anything that we can hope to see from FEMA because the the uh, from Waterbury from 2011, someone just got there. The one paying person who made it all the way through the all the hurdles to uh, get uh, elevation funds just got it. I think in 2023. So uh, I I don't want to see our uh, our residents having to wait for that. And also, post office. We will have a retail post office in downtown. It's uh, it is gr great news. Uh, we don't know exactly when, but great news. And thanks to Bill because uh, it was uh, due to the efforts of our city manager that the post office was talking to the League of Cities and Towns, who wound up uh, subleasing their property to the postal service. And that's all I've got. Well, how can I top that? Uh, well, oh, right. you'll you'll you'll, you'll, you'll have it. You'll have a chance. Well, you come up with the ideas while uh, the city clerk is talking. Uh, I just mentioned that uh, I'm already collecting ballots for the school budget vote on the thirtieth, so that's out there and available, and you can vote. And uh, the board of abatement tomorrow. We've got a big list. We're cramming in. We're still under that. April 15th deadline for everything we can cram in there. We get reimbursed for the education portion. So big list. Hopefully that, hopefully that deadline will change, but ah, well, there you go. So everybody come tomorrow. Thank you, John. Bill. I'd just like to comment that we've had uh, people in the audience for the whole meeting. Thank you for joining. Nobody ever stays till the end. Thank you. I hope <laughs> I hope this was date night. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's great. We appreciate that. Um, so the only thing I actually have to, to add is I testified with Sen at Senate Finance today about uh, extending the deadline for abatement applications. So, or, so uh, that would allow for flood-related abatements that uh, the state would cover the ed tax portion. And... Um, they seemed very confident that, that was going to happen. In fact, they uh, and Jill Remick from the tax department testified that the tax, they had no issues with it, that they were fine. Ed, the ed department, they just wanted to know when they were going to get their money. They, you know, they were like, fine, are we going to get paid once in April and once in September? So I think they were talking about possibly either August 15 or September 15 for an extension. So that would, and, you know, basically, the, and I did say, well, it does. So they want to put it into a bill maybe the miscellaneous tax bill, maybe something else. So it's something that doesn't get passed for two or three weeks. So I, you know, I, I mentioned that that creates a little bit of uncertainty that you know, we've got this April 15 deadline and then sometime in May when you actually pass this bill, but at least the chair, Senator Cummings said, I don't think there's gonna be a problem. I there's no one that's against this. This is going to go. Um, so who knows? No, I, I mean, I think if we, the safest practice would be to get as many done by April 15 as possible, but it does, it does, <laughs> right. So no, but there, you know, there will be more applicants that come in too. That's the thing. We, you know, they, there's no, t there's no deadline on applications, but presumably by, once we get past June 30, now we're talking about taxes for the next fiscal year. So, so then you know, if someone's house was just demolished, their value will change for next year. It's only this current tax year. So I think, you know, by then we should have them all. So it was good news um, because that is an expensive portion for us. And I don't really have anything else at 1036. All right. 1036, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.